OK, looks like we're ready to go. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Matt Wells from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And thank you for being here today. This is the Cutting the Green Tape permitting workshop. Um, we have a number of folks from the department who are here today are going to take us through today's workshop, which is a very exhaustive look at restoration permitting. Uh, this workshop complements last week's cutting the great cutting the green tape workshop focused on restoration granting. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the cutting the green tape effort before we dive into the, the permitting. But first, I'm going to take care of some some basic housekeeping. Um, I've muted participants. We will unmute you during question and comment periods. You'll have a chance to, to chime in with any questions. We have sections identified for that. You can also use the chat feature if you're so inclined through Teams, if you're able to do that. Uh, for those who might be familiar, there's a hand raise feature uh, if you do want to ask a question and get in the queue, and we'll have a, a snapshot of what that looks like in one of the subsequent slides. Um, we're recording today's workshop. We're gonna make it available later this week, along with a copy of today's presentation. If you wanna refer back, if you have to leave early or if colleagues were not able to attend, uh, they will be able to view it at a later date, along with the presentation and recording of last week's granting workshop. So we'll make those available. Um, that's kind of it. Before we dive into um, the agenda of today's permitting, uh, Chad Dibble, our deputy director of our Ecosystem Conservation Division uh, and sort of our leader of the Cutting the Green Tape Initiative is going to quickly walk us through the department's Cutting the Green Tape initiatives, and then we'll dive back into the agenda. So Chad, I'm gonna let you take it away. Great, thanks Matt. Um, yeah, thank you, advance the slide. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I said before, I'm really excited to be here with you uh, in, in what is the second in a series of workshops that the department is putting on or conducting under our Cutting the Green Tape efforts. Um, I quickly wanna orient you and provide you some background as an update to where we've been over the last several months before we dive in, into today's discussion as Matt mentioned. For those of you that joined us on Friday, thank you um, for the PSN workshop. But some of this might be a little bit redundant, but I think it's worth repeating because it's really important. Um, we've been making great progress in our efforts here, and I'm really proud of not only the staff and our commitment to this effort, but also your continued efforts to be actively engaged uh, in this important work, which is evident at uh, today's list as I'm looking here. Looks like we're over 200 participants, so this is really great. I, I just think this is awesome. I'm really excited to, to continue these efforts and work with you and trying to think through how we really increase the pace and scale. And that's what this is about. So in its simplest form, cutting the green tape is the department's you know, contribution to upping the pace and scale of restoration in California. Last July, the department was provided some one-time funding and a way to double down on our efforts in the North Coast, if you will. You know, we already have a, a North Coast salmon project that's functioning and been in operation for a couple of years. Um, and it's, it's a success in our way. And so what we wanted to do was not only continue that, but we wanted to continue those efforts, as well as take on some new initiatives that begin to address some of the stakeholder comments that we've received uh, around the Restoration Leaders Committee and the efforts being taken on by Secretary Crowfoot and, and lots of other conversations we've just had throughout our you know, dialogue in restoration community. The slide in front of you generally depicts our initiative and the process that we've been committed to for this year. It lays out these three categories of collaboration and communication, uh, proposal solicitation process, and the grant and permitting assessments. These boxes are really the bulk of where the, the work is being done for us. With the one-time funding, we've redirected 19 staff within the department that are working on 10 strike teams that, that fit within each of these kind of three categories and really tackle all of these different components. We have strike teams that are working to develop tools to accelerate our grant programs and projects. We're developing a Prop 1 five-year report. We're implementing efficiencies and improvements to our grant programs in coordination with the RLC and the recommendations that they gave us several years ago. We're collaborating on the North Coast Salmon Project, as I mentioned. 
And then the rest of the teams are really focused on our permitting side, and that's the impetus of today. To get you there, we orient ourselves over to the right side of the slide there in that box. That's where we're going to talk about today. These teams are focused on things like CEQA, HREA, collaborating with sustainable conservation in the water board on their EIR and the general order for large habitat, large habitat restoration projects. We're working on landscape conservation planning with a specific note that through these efforts, we've been able to approve now our 17th NCCP in Western Placer County, and we've approved our fourth RCIS. And so that really leads us to, again, what we're here today for, which is last but not least, but our restoration permitting team, the strike team that really has put most of the effort that we're going to talk about today and a lot of emphasis and really designing tools and looking at how can we do restoration permitting differently. They've been working on improving and, um, and streamlining our existing permitting tools, developing new statewide uh, restoration permitting tools, uh, further developing multi-project options, right, and ways to work with programmatic permits from other agencies. We're implementing some pilot projects to test our new statewide permitting tools. So I don't really want to get into all that because that's what we're going to cover today, but I think it's important to recognize the relationship between the restoration permitting team, the North Coast Salmon Project, the PSN and the workshop we had on Friday, and, and how those are really just components of what we're doing here, and they work us down towards that green box at the bottom. It's through all of these efforts of conducting a focused PSN in the North Coast or bringing in these granting and implementing tools, these new permitting tools. This is how we're really going to increase the pace and scale. And this is our approach. And we're here today to talk to you about really what we're doing there. The last thing I want to mention uh, here in kind of my opening remarks is in regards to surveys, which I can't talk about without first saying thank you again to all of you. We've conducted several surveys, right, through RLC, through the North Coast Salmon Project, through the Resource Agency, through the Department's Cutting and Green Tape. You all have filled those out accurately. You've participated. You've been willing uh, to hear what we have to say and answer our questions and ask us questions and work through it. So much of the conversation we're having in these workshops is driven by those surveys and your responses. And they're really important because they've helped us kind of shape and scope what are we hearing? What can we do? And where, where can we go? And they show this, this need, right, for improved communication and coordination. And these workshops are exactly that, right? That's what we're here to do today. So we're working through those things and trying to really say that we're listening to you and um, continue the dialogue with you about what, what we think you're saying and how we're responding and how we work together to move forward. Um, let's see. So let me go to the next slide. So first up on the agenda today will be a discussion on HREA. Then we're going to update you on the restoration management permit that we're really excited about. We'll then cover some um, other tools that we have for restoration permitting and walk you through a couple of case studies. All right, we'll close out the meeting with an update on our efforts of the landscape conservation planning efforts, which I think is on the next slide, right? And uh, really talk to you about NCCP, RCS, and RCIS and what's happening there. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a team of people working on these things, right? So we've got a whole slew of folks that are in the department, cross from, from admin to managers to executives to staff to specialists, et cetera, working across engineers. We're really trying to, inside the department, talk about this as, as a group, really think outside of the box and work towards collaboration on how we can address some of these things. But joining us today are several staff that will be presenting. Madeline Whelan will be presenting. She's our CISA Compliance and HRA Coordinator in the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. Steve Ingram is our co-leader of Restoration Permitting Team. He's also our Assistant Chief Counsel at the department. Dylan Inskeep is our FRGP Regulatory Coordinator in our Water Restoration Grants Branch. Um, Brad Henderson is a co-leader of the Restoration Permitting Team and our Senior Environmental Scientist Supervisor up in the Northern Region. Jennifer Olson is a Senior Environmental Sci uh, Scientist Specialist in our Northern Region. Shannon Lucas, who is a Senior Environmental Scientist Supervisor in our Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. Amy Olson, who is our RCIS Coordinator, also in our Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. And last but not least, of course, we have Matt Wells, who's going to be sort of navigating and orchestrating today's uh, festivities and working things through. 
So again, I'm just really happy that everybody's here. I appreciate you showing up. Our number is, oh my gosh, over 260 people now. If I'm looking at the attendance right, this is outstanding. I uh, encourage you to ask questions. I encourage you to um, have dialogue with our staff and the folks that are presenting today. I encourage you to um, listen with an open ear as we've been trying to do with all of our conversations with you. And um, know that this doesn't end the conversation today. While it's scheduled from one to five, I think that's a long time for us to meet today and some of you may have to leave early, but know that the conversation isn't over. We will have a chance for you to submit additional comments. You can always pick up the phone and call us or set up a Teams, a Zoom, a WebEx, whatever platform you're using. We're happy to continue these conversations and work with you to really figure out how we make some concrete changes going forward for the department and for the state of California as it, as it relates to restoration. So thank you again for having me. Thank you again for being here. And uh, I look forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Chad. Chad went ahead and covered the agenda, uh, which is great. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so first up, uh, we're gonna talk about the Habitat Restoration Enhancement Act, HREA. Uh, and Madeline Weiland from the department is here to talk about that. Uh, Maddie, are you able to unmute? Hopefully. That I am. Okay, just give me a cue when you want me to advance. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Madeline Weiland. I specialize in CESA and HREA permitting. Uh, CESA, of course, stands for the California Endangered Species Act, and HREA stands for Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act. Okay, so. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's start with the boring part real quick and get it out of the way. Uh, HREA is found in California Fish and Game Code sections 1650 through 1657. And the act is tied to the State Water Resources Control Board's Order for Clean Water Act Section 401 General Water Quality Certification for Small Habitat Restoration Projects. But that is too long, so we just call it SHRP or SHRP certification. Now on to a little bit more fun part. What does the HREA do? What is it for? It's tailored for small restoration projects with little or no adverse impacts. Approved projects do not need additional CDFW permits, such as CESA take authorizations or LSA agreements. Everyone's favorite part of the HREA, expedited review. CDFW must issue a decision on a request to approve a project within 30 or 60 days, depending on the pathway, and I will get to that in a little bit. And unlike many restoration project approvals, there is a fee and it follows the LSA fee schedule, which I know many of you are familiar with. This helps cover the costs of that expedited review time. In order to be eligible for HREA, a project must have the primary purpose of improving fish and wildlife habitat, meaning it can't be a project to build a house or protect property that happens to include a habitat enhancement element. A project must also meet that SHRP eligibility requirements, which are on the next slide. So SHRP is that water board certification that I mentioned before. To receive SHRP certification for a project, an applicant submits a notice of intent to the water board. If the project is eligible, the water board may issue a notice of applicability stating that the SHRP general order is applicable for the project. SHRP certification has its own eligibility requirements, such as the project has to be eligible for that class 33 categorical exemption for small habitat restoration projects. The project size cannot exceed five acres or a cumulative total of 500 linear feet of stream bank or coastline. The project can't be a compensatory mitigation project. The project has to have, here's that primary purpose again, the project has to have the primary purpose of habitat restoration. Uh, it can't be part of a larger project whose primary purpose is not habitat restoration like land development or flood management. And lastly, the project construction period cannot exceed five years. Uh, next slide, please. So the HREA requires that a project be eligible for SHRP certification, but does not require that the project actually have received that SHRP certification yet. So in fact, there are two pathways under HREA one for projects that do have SHRP certification and one for projects that have not yet received it. The 1652 pathway, and that's short for California Fish and Game Code section 1652, is for projects that have not yet received SHRP certification. As these projects have not already been approved by the Water Board, there are additional requirements the project must meet specific to this section. 
such as the project must not or it must not be mitigation. It must be voluntary. It can't be part of a regulatory permit, a regulatory settlement, a regulatory enforcement action, or part of a court order. It must also be consistent with the best available restoration or enhancement methodologies, such as uh, species recovery plans or NIMPS fish screening criteria or fish patches guidelines. Other examples are the California Salmonid Stream Habitat Restoration Manual or other guidance docs or manuals approved by CDFW. Um, the project must not result in cumulative adverse environmental impacts that are significant when viewed in connection with other past or present or potential future projects. Again, since these projects have not already received water board approval, we ask for additional information to be included with an approval request. And we have a longer approval timeline for this pathway. Once the request and fee is received, we have 60 days to issue a determination on whether the project is eligible and whether the request includes all the required documents and information. On the last slide for this topic, I've included the website where you can find the list for this information. So you'll be able to um, you'll be able to see all the information and documents that are required as well as find information about fees and where to send the request and we'll get there. So I also strongly encourage consulting with CDFW before submitting a project approval request to make sure HREA is appropriate for your project. All right, I see we've moved on to the next slide. So the other permitting pathway is detailed under section 1653 of Fish and Game Code. This pathway is directly tied to that SHRP certification and projects must already have 401 SHRP certification to be eligible for this pathway. In general, a project with SHRP certification can be easily permitted. There are some exceptions. One example of an exception is a project that fits the water board definition of restoration, but doesn't fit the CDFW definition of restoration. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later too. So along with SHRP certification, a project approval request needs to include species protection measures to avoid and minimize impacts to potentially present species that are protected by state and federal law. These measures can include appropriate seasonal work windows or pre-construction surveys, surveys. Since this is kind of a consistency determination with that SHRP certification, this is a, a shorter 30-day approval timeline. Project proponents can just submit their fee and request, which is a simple checklist form, along with a notice of applicability from the Water Board, a copy of the notice of intent that was sent to the Water Board to get that notice of applicability, and appropriate species protection measures. Once again, I really recommend advanced consultation with CDFW to help ensure that everything that we need is included in your request. Next slide, please. All right, why is this advanced consultation so important? Why do I keep pushing this? Well, HREA approval requests are supposed to be front loaded with all of the appropriate documents and information all in the beginning. And if they're missing certain aspects, you can run the risk of your request being deemed incomplete or ineligible. Um, advanced consultation can help prevent this. If you check with us before submitting your approval request, we can help determine is your project eligible? Meaning, is it the right size? Are there cumulative adverse impacts? Is it restoration as defined by CDFW? For example, we do not always consider stream bank stabilization to be habitat restoration or enhancement. Um, so projects with SHRP certification that are stream bank stabilization are not necessarily not necessarily eligible for HREA. So if you check with us beforehand, we can save you the hassle of applying for an authorization that doesn't work for your project. Which brings us to our next bullet point. We can help you determine if HREA is the best fit for your project. If you don't need CESA coverage, LSA might be a better path for you as it has more flexibility, the ability to negotiate, e.g. shifting work windows during project implementation. HREA doesn't currently have that flexibility. We can also help review your designs and help determine if they include the best available methodologies or if technical or engineering aspects of your design are appropriate. Uh, one of the last things we do is we can help make sure your species protection measures are adequate and include all the protected species that may be within your project area. For example, most HREA requests are fish passage projects. But they can still have effects on terrestrial species and those species need species protection measures as well. 
we can help you look up species, what species might be present in that project area using our CNDDB, the California Natural Diversity Database, or, or BIOS. You can find more information about the HREA, such as how to apply at this website here on the screen, wildlife.ca.gov slash conservation slash environmental dash review slash HREA. Um, and you can also send an email directly to me or my co-coordinator, Lucy Howarth. And that's uh, our first name, dot last name, madeline.wheeland at wildlife.ca.gov or lucy.howarth at wildlife.ca.gov. And we can help you answer general questions about eligibility and process and put you into contact with the regional CDFW staff in your project area that can help you answer project specific questions. All right, thank you. Thanks, Madeline. OK, that's great. Moving on to our next topic, which is looking at restoration management permit uh, topics. Uh, and this is going to be covered by Steve Ingram with the department. He is the co-leader of our restoration permitting team and also the department's assistant chief counsel. So Steve, go ahead and take it away. OK, thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether my camera is going to work, but since you're mostly going to be watching the slides, that probably doesn't matter. Um, uh, but anyway, again, good afternoon. I'm Steve Ingram, and I'm going to be talking about a new permitting tool that we've developed that we refer to as the Restoration Management Permit, or RMP. Um, and you can go ahead and next slide. So I want to start by explaining a little bit about why we think the RMP is needed and the function it fulfills. We shouldn't be creating new permits unless there's a reason for them and a purpose. So right now, a restoration project if a restoration project needs take authorization from CDFW, you may need to obtain up to three separate authorizations that would come in three separate permits. Um, and even for the CESA authorization, authorization under the California Endangered Species Act, we in the past have done that through incidental take permits, which are not really an appropriate tool for most restoration projects. We've done it through 2081A MOUs, 2081, 2081A permits, um, and but the department has had multiple inconsistent templates for both of those tools as well. In addition, uh, the authorizations have been issued out of multiple different units within the department. So sometimes they've been issued out of our regional offices, but also out of our fisheries branch and wildlife branch. And the, the RMP is designed to do a couple things. First, to consolidate all of these take authorizations for CESA, for fully protected species statutes, and for all of the species of special concern and common species that would be permitted under the scientific collection process and bring them all in and consolidate them in one single permit, one single approval. This will also then allow project proponents to work just with a single unit within the department rather than having to work with um, multiple different regions and branches to get approvals for a single project. Um, and we are hoping to also consolidate the work that's going to be done on the M RMP um, with the same unit that will be preparing an LSA agreement if one is necessary for the project. So we're, we're hoping that this will consolidate both the uh, take authorizations in one document and also consolidate the folks in the department who are going to be working on that approval. All of this, we hope, is going to result in some significant efficiencies in permitting, like reducing the time it would take to obtain the permits, um, but also critically reducing confusion over the requirements and eliminating the possibility of conflicting mandates from different parts of the department. So we're hoping to create more predictability and more certainty as to the form of the take authorization. Uh, in addition, we're hoping that eventually we'll be able to achieve some additional efficiencies with regard to permit application processes and permit fees. So as you may know, we can't require a particular application to be used for a permit unless it's been adopted through a statute or regulation. And right now, we don't have an actual um, application process for 2081A. Uh, we do have one for fully protected species take authorizations, and we have a separate one for scientific collection permits. Um, and they're similar, but not quite the same. One of the things that we are hoping to do in the short run is try to figure out how to um, line these application processes up to make it as simple as possible to navigate the application itself. And then second, um, I think as Chad mentioned, we right now have funding and staffing for the Cutting the Green Tape initiative just for this fiscal year. If we do get funding to continue beyond the end of the fiscal year, 
one of our hopes is that we might be able to do a formal rulemaking to establish you know, some new regulations that would govern restoration projects. And one of the things that we could do then through that rulemaking is create a single unified application process. So there'd just be one single application for all of these um, different authorizations. Similarly with fees, um, there are no 2081A permit fees for restoration projects. Um, there are no fully protected fees to get those approvals, um, but there are fees for scientific collecting permits, and there are um, fees also for LSA agreements um, if you need that for your project. And again, if we are able to do a rulemaking eventually, one of the things that we um, may be looking at is ways to either lower some of those fees for restoration projects or even consider waiving some of them entirely. Uh, next slide, please. So as a threshold matter, I just wanted to mention that there's essentially four cat broad categories of species for which you might need take authorization. And these are all protected by different statutory schemes. So first we have our CESA listed species, those protected by the California Endangered Species Act, um, specifically for uh, section 28, um, the, the prohibition is in section 2080 of our code. Then we have the fully protected species, and those are covered by three, four different statutes, one relating to birds, one mammals, one reptiles and amphibians, and one fish. And um, each of those has its own separate um, prohibition and, and form of take authorization. And then we've got species of special concern and common species. And um, many people um, uh, don't fully understand the species of special concern. They, they have no actual special protection under the Fish and Game Code. They don't have any special protection above and beyond what's given to other common species. They are treated differently in the CEQA process, and we do treat them differently in a variety of ways in terms of the attention we pay to them. But in terms of the actual protections in the Fish and Game Code, they are just like any other common species. And so they are covered, both species of special concern and common species are protected by Section 2000 of our code. And then there are also some specialized statutes that may protect a particular class of species. For example, um, raptors, whether they're common or species of special concern are protected by Section 3503.5 of our code. Um, Section 3513 protects migratory birds. So we do have some of these specialized protections. Um, but this is um, these are generally the four categories that we'd be looking at. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, um, if you've worked with, with the department before on a variety of different types of projects, there is a dizzying array of different mechanisms for authorizing take. And sorry for the really busy slide, but we were trying to pack in everything here. So for CESA listed species, there's actually six totally different mechanisms for take. There's permits and MOUs under 2081A. There's incidental take permits under 2081B. Um, safe Harbor agreements, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes. There's our voluntary local program, which is um, similar to safe harbor agreements in some ways, but um, specifically for the ag community. There's HREA that, that Madeline just spoke about. And then of course there's the NCCP program. For fully protected species, the take can be authorized either under the MOUs for the four fully protected um, species statutes. And again, a few years ago, we amended the NCCPA to um, allow take a fully protected species through an NCCP if it provides for the conservation of that species. And then for the species of special concern and common species, it can be authorized through a scientific collection permit, which is probably the most common method. A lake and stream bed alteration agreement can provide some um, take authority for common species and species of special concern, particularly for moving things out of harm's way, which can constitute a reasonable measure for the protection of fish and wildlife. Um, and then, of course, safe harbor agreements, HREA and NCCP can work for these categories as well. So for all but the most seasoned permitting experts, just figuring out which of these tools would work for a given project can be really time consuming and intellectually taxing. And so one of the things we're trying to do with the RMP is simplify and standardize that process. Next slide, please. So some restoration projects may qualify for HREA, they may benefit from a safe harbor agreement, but most larger restoration projects will benefit from the RMPs combination of these different take authorizations. And it's, it's really a combination of three, the section 2081A for CESA species, the fully protected MOU, and the SCP scientific collecting permit for the other species. 
And the key authorizing language in these statutes is shown in the slide. So for CESA listed species, we, we can authorize take for scientific, educational, or management purposes. And for purposes of the RMP, management's kind of the key term here. Um, CESA, oddly enough, doesn't actually contain a definition of management, but Section 2061, which is part of CESA, does define scientific resources management. And there are some court decisions suggesting that that definition would apply under 2081A as well. And so that definition includes in the scope of management activities, management purposes, things like habitat acquisition, restoration and maintenance, propagation, live trapping, transplantation, a lot of the key things you would look for in a um, restoration project. For fully protected species, we can issue take for necessary scientific research, including efforts to recover fully protected, threatened, or endangered species. And here it's that efforts to recover language that's probably the key for the RMP. And one of the things I wanna make special note of is in order to get take coverage for fully protected, you do not need to be engaged in an effort to recover that fully protected species. It can be another species if it's fully protected, threatened, or endangered. And then for the uh, species of special concern and common species, it's the scientific collecting permit standard. And there we can issue take authorization for scientific, educational, or propagation purposes. And it may seem a little counterintuitive at first, but propagation is sort of the key term here. And if you look at our um, SCP regulations that we've adopted, we do define propagation to include efforts to, among other things, capture, temporarily possess, and relocate wildlife to avoid harm and mortality. So things like moving species out of harm's way actually qualifies as a propagation measure and purpose. And then lastly, I'd just like to note that all three of these statutory schemes include scientific purposes. Um, and so if a restoration project also has a scientific research component to it, and there would be a different type of take associated with that scientific research, that can also be authorized under the RMP for any of these categories of species. Next slide. So very quickly, each of these tech take mechanisms we're talking about can be used to authorize a variety of different types of take. So for most frequently, restoration projects are gonna need take coverage for translocation of individuals of the covered species or moving individuals of a covered species out of harm's way. And not everybody thinks of that as take, take, but it does, either one of those would qualify as take under the pursue, catch, and capture portions of that take definition. Um, many people hear pursuit, catch, and capture, and they think hunting, but it's really, it doesn't matter what the purpose of catching or capturing it is. If you're doing that, you are engaging in take and you need coverage. So that would be um, some of the main, and then in addition to that, there's lethal take, which would typically cover either inadvertent lethal take during translocation or movement out of harm's way, or accidental take that occurs during project activities, but it could be any form of lethal take there. Next slide, please. So I wanna move on and talk a little bit about, we talked about the purpose of it and some of the things that the RMP would accomplish and, and how it melds together these different take authorizations. I wanna run through a little bit about the structure of the RMP template itself. So we have prepared a template, we have it now, um, and we're ready to start using it. As I mentioned, this is a single comprehensive template that includes all three of these take authorizations. If you have a project that doesn't require all three, there's instructions in the template, both for um, our staff who are gonna be working on the permitting and for the stakeholders to see that includes instructions for deleting certain provisions. So if you only need CESA coverage um, and fully protected species coverage, but you don't need it for other species, then you can simply remove those parts from the template. So this allows us to fulfill a whole combination of needs with still having just a single template. Um, so also the RMP is authorized is designed to authorize take relating to all different stages of project development. And this is everything from construction and implementation to ongoing operations and maintenance and to monitoring, including both monitoring during construction and post project monitoring. So we, you don't need to get one permit for the construction and monitoring during construction and a separate post project uh, monitoring permit of any kind. We can do all of this in one permit. And then finally, I wanted to just note a couple quick things about the relationship between an RMP and the an LSA agreement, if, if you have a project that needs um, both take coverage and um, an LSA. 
the RMP right now does not incorporate 1600 and the LSA authorization into the RMP. And this is primarily because of some of the very unique aspects of 1600 permitting, including the notification process, the timelines that are in there, the op law provision, the arbitration provisions. It, it's actually quite difficult to figure out how to meld all of those things in with another permitting scheme. However, that said, once we've tested the current RMP template, and if we have funding and staffing to continue this effort next year, one of the things we could explore in a rulemaking is also this idea of um, creating a foundation for trying to merge uh, the LSA agreement itself into the RMP. And this could be done either by just, it could be merging just the notification for a 1600 agreement for a restoration project with the applications for the other take authorizations, or it could be an effort to try to merge the permit approvals themselves. Um, we'll have we'll have to see how well that will work, but that that will be um, uh, a later stage of this process. And then the other thing I wanted to mention with the LSA is that if you are obtaining an LSA, then you may not need to get the uh, scientific collection permit authority through the RMP. And that's because you can actually get some um, take authorization for species of special concern and common species through um, the 1600 agreement itself. And the reason this is important is if you can actually get that coverage through the LSA and not have to do it through the RMP, first of all, it means you would not have to pay the scientific collecting for permit fee, which is a separate fee that's required right now. Um, but the other thing is that the uh, scientific collecting permit regulations we have are highly prescriptive. There's, they're very heavy on process. And right now they probably create the greatest burden on issuing the RMP. And so if you don't need that authority to be included in the RMP and can get it through an LSA, then it might simplify the RMP process a lot. And again, we're hoping to simplify some of those scientific collecting permit um, processes even through the RMP if we get the chance to do a rulemaking eventually. Next slide, please. So the RMP is comprised of a whole bunch of fairly standard provisions that look a lot like things you've probably seen in other permits, um, along with conditions of approval. What we're trying to do to the maximum extent possible is create a standard template with standard provisions, many of which are gonna have just fill in the blank um, portions to them, so that the process of developing and issuing an RMP can be as simple and quick as possible. That said, we do recognize that every project is different and many projects, probably most of them, are going to require some project specific terms and some project specific uh, conditions of approval. And so we're trying to both simplify the permit and make it easy to fill out, but also recognize the uniqueness of each permit and each project. So I want to briefly just mention a couple of the key provisions in here, and many of these are going to be things you would expect to see in a permit of this kind. Um, one is there, there'd be a table of the covered species that will be broken out by the different categories of species, whether it's CESA, fully protected, species of special concern. Um, there'd be a separate table with the authorized take level uh, as well. And if you're getting to the point where you might exceed that authorized take level, there's a fairly simple process for amending the permit to um, increase the take, uh, the authorized take level. There's also um, going to be a section for the summary of the project activity. So here, this is your detailed project description, and this is a really key provision for pretty much any permit, but it will be very important for this one because your take coverage um, only extends so long as you are um, uh, proceeding with the project according to the project description. If the project description changes, we need to amend the permit. Otherwise, you may not actually be covered um, for purposes of take under the permit. So that project description is always a key term. Next slide, please. So these are just some other general provisions um, that will be fairly standard from RMP to RMP. One of them is the term of the RMP, and that is right now the standard term for this RMP is set at three years. And that's gonna probably sound way too uh, short a time for many of you. And we do recognize that the reason it's set at three years is by statute, that's the maximum amount of time allowed for a scientific collecting permit. And so what we're hoping to do is, um, you know, hoping to divert as many as possible over to getting that coverage for movement out of harm's way um, through the LSA as opposed to the SCP so that we can then 
um, get around the three-year limitation on scientific collection permits. If there is no SCP coverage needed, the term can be longer and that can be negotiated with the permitting staff. If you can get the SCP type coverage through an LSA, then again, the term can be longer. If you do need it and it has to be done through the RMP, then you would need to focus on um, renewal or amendment of the permit um, at the end of the three years if you need more time. So real quickly, the difference between renewal and amendment. Renewals are um, where you have a permit and you simply want to renew it with the exact same substantive terms and all you're doing is extending the term of the agreement. Uh, whereas an amendment is where you're actually making a, one or more changes to the substantive terms, which can also include an extension of the term of the permit. In general, the RMP has a fairly simplified uh, renewal and amendment processes. processes. They, um, we would be able to process renewals and amendments fairly quickly. The, there is no fee under the, for the amendment um, or renewal under either the CESA portion or the fully protected. But again, there is under the SCP, at least until we can consider um, special fees for restoration projects. And then lastly, with amendments, amendments can either be by mutual agreement, um, which, and which frequently come at the request of the permittee, or there are some limited cases in which um, the department could unilaterally amend permits. And that's usually if there's been a change in law and we're required to amend the permit to bring it into conformity with um, existing law, or in the very rare instance in which continued implementation of a project might jeopardize the continued existence of the species. So those types of things. There's also a suspension and revocation process in there, which is fairly simple. Um, and that is designed to comply with both the fully protected regulations and the SCP regulations. And then lastly, we will have findings in there um, with regard to the CESA component of the RMP. Next slide, please. So then conditions of approval, these are kind of the heart of really any um, permit, and they're also where each of the permits are going to differ the most. That said, we are trying to develop as much as possible some standard conditions of approval that would be the same from permit to permit. And so first, there are the general conditions of approval. And these are the types of things you often see in permits from the department, um, things like legal compliance. Um, the permittee agrees to um, abide by all applicable federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Compliance with the CEQA process. And then compliance with other regulatory permits you receive, maybe an LSA agreement, maybe um, take authorization under the Federal Endangered Species Act, maybe water board permits, whatever it may be. And then some other standard provisions like um, project site access for department staff, um, the designated biologist, a list of authorized individuals, um, these types of general conditions. Then we also, um, We'll have, and, and this is more of the heart of the permit and where we get into the conditions of approval that relate to the specific project, um, conditions of approval relating to the restoration work and the ongoing implementation. So this could include monitoring during construction. This is where we would have the specific conditions for movement out of harm's way, for translocation of the covered species, for reporting mortality and injury of the species. And then there's also a placeholder in the template for any additional conditions of approval that may be necessary that are project specific. Often there might be some species specific um, provisions that need to be added there. And then the third type of conditions of approval are the monitoring and reporting ones. And this is where we would have the um, ongoing post project monitoring. This is where we'd have the conditions relating to the annual reporting the contacts uh, for reporting. And again, we'd have a placeholder for additional conditions of approval as needed. And next slide, please. So th that's kind of a, a brief overview of the structure of the permit. And then we also wanted to take a second to talk about um, programmatic permitting. And I know, we know there's been a lot of interest in um, having the department explore programmatic forms of permitting. Um, Unfortunately, none of our statutes explicitly give us the ability to issue truly programmatic permits, and we are looking at whether there are ways to do it even without that explicit authorization. There may be ways to amend them at some point, but there is one thing we can do right now without having to um, to utilize. Uh, there is one thing we can do right now without having to, to obtain some additional authorization 
or stretch our permitting schemes too far out of the ordinary. And that is we can do multi-project permitting. We've done this in the development context where we've had a single permit, for example, incidental take permits that we issue that might cover multiple development projects. If we can do it for development, we can do it for restoration. And so the idea would be to issue a single RMP that might cover multiple restoration projects. These could either be multiple projects to be developed by a single permittee, or they could be multiple permittees. Um, whether it makes sense to do this and whether it will actually result in the efficiencies that we would want depends on a few key factors. So for example, multi-project permitting is easiest and most effective when one or more of the following uh, is true. There's a single CEQA document that covers all of the projects. That makes it much easier because a lot of times we're trying to line up things in the CEQA document with some of the permit terms in our permits. And if we're working from a single CEQA document, it becomes that much easier to do that. Um, if, the, if the multiple projects are located within some reasonably defined area, like a single watershed or hydrologic unit, possibly even an eco region, that, that makes it a little bit easier. We don't want to be issuing uh, a multi-project RMP where one project is in the North Coast and another is in the Bay Area. That's It's just too difficult to come to um, uh, consistent permit terms and everything. Um, and then lastly, we want projects that are similar in nature. And you know, it, we can do a, a RMP for m multiple projects much easier if, for example, they're all fish projects. It would be harder to do it if we had one fish passage project and one project to restore ponds for um, California tiger salamander or something like that. So the more they are similar in nature, the easy it is, easier it is to be able to do that multi-project permitting. Um, and lastly, if you've got multiple project proponents, multiple permittees, it's really important that those permittees are familiar with one another and are capable of coordinating closely, um, both through the permitting process and through the implementation process. And that will just make it a lot easier. So we do think that in the short run, this is one thing we could do, and we can do multi-project permitting with this RMP. And so we're hoping that that is a, um, a way to start moving towards some kind of um, programmatic permitting for restoration projects in the short run. Next slide, please. So lastly, we're not at this point, we're not rolling out this RMP for general use throughout the department. It's a new tool. It's been reviewed very extensively within the department, and we have high hopes for it, but it needs testing and it needs some ground truthing. And so what we are doing, the restoration permitting team right now, is we're trying to identify roughly three to five projects that we can use to test the RMP. And we're hoping to get a diverse group of projects, both in the locations, um, and right now we're looking at projects a couple projects in our um, uh, region one in the north coast area we are also looking though at one project down in the south coast region and one project in our inland desert region um, so we're, we're hoping that this is going to be a statewide tool and we're trying to um, get a little bit of diversity in the types of project locations we're also trying to get some diversity in the different types of combinations of authorizations that are needed so for example, of the projects we're looking at right now, several of them require fully protected species coverage, several of them do not. Um, a few of them might require the um, coverage for common species through the RMP, and a few of them might be able to get it through uh, an LSA agreement. So we wanna be able to test um, the different combinations of authorizations to see how flexible and how you know useful the permit is in that way. And lastly, while we all know that project timelines never work out the way we want to. We're hoping that we can identify at least a couple projects, pilot projects that are at a fairly advanced stage of planning and for which it may be possible to issue permits before uh, the end of this fiscal year. Some of them we clearly will not be able to get there. We'll be able to start but not complete it, but we're hoping to get um, at least a few of them um, over the finish line by the end of the fiscal year. So that's pretty much it on on the RMP um, and we'll, we'll be opening it up for questions in a few minutes after we get through a couple of other short topics. Um, but to sum it up really quickly, the RMP is really designed to do a couple things. Consolidate all the take authorizations in one permit, standardize these permitting processes for restoration permits department wide and to simplify the permitting process and create a, you know, an easy to use template 
that as much as possible depends on things like fill in the blank provisions that are fairly easy so that permitting can be quick and efficient. And that's all we've got, Matt, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, great. Yeah, we, we have a few questions queued up in uh, the chat and we can uh, wait to do those if you'd like, uh, Steve, Brad. Um, I know we have a lot to get through. Uh, there, some of them are RMP specific. Do you want to wait or? Um, I'm just looking through to see. Um, Can you see them? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking through right now. I mean, we could try to address a couple of them real quick right now, I think. Um, there's a question here about can the RMP be used for compensatory mitigation projects? Um, no, it can't, and it can't for a couple reasons. Um, one of them is that 2081A is really not designed to be used. If you need compensatory mitigation, you're probably looking at an incidental take permit, not a 2081A authorization. Um, it's also um, not possible to get uh, fully protected species coverage through the fully protected MOU process for compensatory mitigation either. These are just for really for true restoration projects. Um, so how will the RMP integrate with CESA consistency determination process? Um, I don't, it doesn't really cross over with consistency determination. If you need, if you get a consistency determination, um, that is a very separate type of approval. And in fact, you're not really getting a permit from the department at all. You're getting confirmation you don't need a permit. So if you do get a CD and you need other coverage, like the fully protected coverage or scientific collection permit type coverage, you would need to then go get those separate authorizations. It may be possible to get a CD and then also get an RMP that excludes the 2081 um, A authorization. You would just have to think about whether it made sense to do that or whether if you're already getting the RMP, whether you want to just forego the CD and, um, and get your CESA coverage through the RMP. And and I'm just looking. Yeah, maybe we can go on and, and move on to the other presentations and come back yeah. and, and let people we'll, ask a few we'll, more of these. We'll certainly track all of these questions and, and get them answered. And if we need to um, do some homework on some of them, they might be a little specific. But um, in the interest of, of uh, staying on on track and on schedule, we're going to change gears and talk about the fisheries restoration grant program. Uh, Dylan Inskeep, who is the FRGP regulatory coordinator within the watershed restoration grants branch, is going to walk us through that process. Dylan. Hey everyone, my name is Dylan Inskeep and like Matt said, I'm the regulatory coordinator for FRGP. I'm just going to give you a short background on FRGP today as it will take its own five hour top uh, workshop if needed. Um, so next slide, please, Matt. So yeah, so FRGP is unique in that it's a competitive grant program that was funded 40 years ago in 1981. And we're actually both the grantee and the grantor. We apply to the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund each year um, and get roughly around $14 million to use for our grant program. And then we turn around and we do a proposal solicitation notice every year for state agencies, tribal governments, and nonprofit organizations with the goal to restore anadromous salmon habitat within California. Um, currently, as of today at 9 a.m., we did release the 2021 proposal solicitation notice. Um, it will be closing on April 13th at 3 p.m. And you can find that on the FRGP page on the main CFW website. So FRGP is a little um, unique, especially because we actually do provide some programmatic coverage if you are funded into our program. As you can see, we have three Clean Water Act Section 404 Regional General Permits, 12, 16, and 78. Um, RGB 12 is under the San Francisco Army Corps District, and it basically covers areas from the inland portion of San Luis, San Luis Obispo County to the Oregon border. And it's roughly about 20 counties. Um, RGB 16, which is under the Sacramento Army Corps District, covers the range of salmon and steelhead habitat within the Central Valley, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta, as well as Sassoon Bay. And that's roughly portions of 27 counties in California. And last is RGB 78, which is under the LA District's Army Corps. 
And that covers from the coastal portion of San Luis Obispo County all the way down to the Mexico border, which is roughly eight counties. Um, it's worth to note that for 12 and 78, where they are mainly coastal counties, these permits do not cover currently tidally influenced areas. You have to be out of the tide zone to be covered under these. Um, FRGP also covers for projects that can meet our requirements, annual um, Clean Water Act Section 401 water quality certification. We do this annually with each fiscal year's batch of projects, um, and it's good for the term of your um, project through FRGP. And we also cover CEQA through a, for both non-implementation and implementation project types under a mitigated negative declaration each year. If you can meet the requirements for our 404s and our CEQA document, we most likely will be able to cover you permanently, um, pro programmatically for all these different permits. That is safe to say, though, we can also fund you through FRGP should you not be able to use these permits. You're just going to have to get your own. Um, we'd also really like to mention that if you are planning to use our programmatics or you have questions about regional specific questions, come to us very early on in the grant um, process. That way we can make sure that you actually fit within to our restoration permits. But while we might not cover anything else, it might also allow us to find out if we would also be able to help provide some coverage through ITP where CFW regional staff actually go out into the field with you under FRGP to do those services. Um, but that's all based on bandwidth for that region. So you really need to reach out early. Also, most of the time, the grant manager that you would be assigned in your FRGB project will also most likely be writing your 1600 agreement. So it's always helpful for them to know what will be coming through the pipeline in terms of grants. Um, some future 404 permitting changes that we'd like to make you all aware of. RGB 12, which again covers inland portion of San Luis Obispo County to the Oregon border, is currently in, re in the renewal process with NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Army Corps. And some big ticket changes that will be occurring, we're still in the talks with, is we will be adding in BDA coverage, so Beaver Dam analog coverage to the permit. We are looking to also add in tidally influenced area coverage for that whole stretch as well as currently project size is limited to 500 contiguous feet in RGB 12, do water disturbed, and we will be raising that to 1,000 contiguous feet. Um, so like I was saying, we don't have coverage currently for RGB 78 in for um, tidally influenced areas, and we currently don't for RGB 12, but we're looking to add that. On top of that, we're also working with the California Coastal Commission on a pilot permit to cover um, Humboldt County, Mendocino County, and Del Norte County through a programmatic coastal development permit. It's still in its infancy. We're hoping to have that within a year. If that all goes well, then we would expand that permit with the California Coastal Commission to the entirety of RGB 12. While we're still in talks with NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with RGB 12 to include tidally influenced areas. And then once that's all finished, we would then work on the portion of RGB 78, which is Southern California, to include both tidally influenced areas in the RGB as well as a coastal development permit with the California Coastal Commission. So you should expect to see those changes within a year is what our goal is. Um, and we're really excited for that. And that's really all I have for FRGP. Just remember, you can always ask us any questions, um, Dylan Inskeep again, or you can find all the information from the new PSN on the FRGP webpage on the main CDFW page. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Um, real quick, uh, Dylan, you might be able to cover this. There's a question um, when you mentioned um, staying outside the uh, title zone. Was that historic or current? Do you know if a parcel was historically um title and will be restored is that considered outside or do we need to look into that sorry i clicked the camera and not the mic <laughs> um yeah so it's designed to, as bob just put in the chat it's defined as the coastal zone not necessarily the title zone so if you look up that definition, it will answer that question for you. And Julie, can projects funded under the C Coast uh, Cutting the Green Tape PSN receive program coverage under FRGP? No, that currently is only available for FRGP funded projects. 
Um, so yeah, you'd have to be funded through our program to use our programmatics currently. Right. Thanks, Dylan. OK, moving on. Um, next, we are going to talk about safe harbor agreements, and we're going back to Madeline Weiland. Madeline. Hi, everybody. It's me again. All right. So CDFW knows that collaboration with private landowners is critical to species recovery, as many declining species occur primarily or exclusively on private property. Let's go to next slide. So we introduced the California State Safe Harbor Agreement Program Act. It is found in Fish and Game Code sections 2089.2 to 2089.25. It's a voluntary program, yay, no fee. And the point of it is to encourage private landowners to manage their lands uh, for a net conservation benefit of threatened, endangered candidate or declining or vulnerable species. In return for this collaborative stewardship approach, the landowner receives authorization for acts that are or may become prohibited, such as incidental take of the species. So for example, if a landowner gets a safe harbor agreement for declining or vulnerable species, and that species later becomes a candidate or listed, the safe harbor agreement still provides coverage. Next slide, please. There are four basic components to a safe harbor agreement. Establish baseline conditions. That's how many of the species are there already on your property or how much habitat for the species is on your property or both. And then identify management practices that will provide a net conservation benefit. This net benefit can include um, habitat set aside or created for species or allowing research on your property that will benefit the species. And then next we develop a monitoring plan to evaluate the effectiveness of these management practices. And then last, we find a way to ensure sufficient funding to carry out all these components that I just talked about. This is much less stringent than the CESA funding assurances requirement for ITPs and CDs. And it's uh, something we can work on together to figure out how to make it work. Safe Harbor agreements are voluntary collaboration between CDFW and a landowner. We work together to complete these steps. We draft an agreement that uh, works for everybody as much as possible. Lastly, we also have an option for federal safe harbor agreement consistency determinations. If a landowner already has a federal safe harbor agreement authorizing take for a duly listed species, that's a species listed by both the Federal Endangered Species Act and CESA, they can request to the director of CDFW that we find their safe harbor agreement consistent with the California State Safe Harbor Agreement program. If it's found to be consistent, the safe harbor agreement consistency determination is issued and no further authorization or approval is necessary under CESA. We've got a lot of great examples of some previously approved safe harbor agreements on our website. Next slide, please. And you can find our website here on the screen. Um, you can also just search for CDFW safe harbor agreements and it'll show right up. You can also send questions to Katrina Smith or myself, Madeline Wieland at wildlife.ca.gov. And um, or you can contact your regional office as well. And we look forward to working with you to conserve species and their habitats. So thank you. Thanks, Madeline. That's great. Um, OK, moving on, we're going to talk about consistency, consistency de determinations for programmatic BOs. And I think this is Steve Ingram. And maybe Brad. Yep, thank you. So. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. So again, as, as Chad noted, and as I noted earlier, when we were talking about the multi-project permitting, um, we understand that there's a lot of interest among a lot of the stakeholders in programmatic approaches to permitting. And one of the things we've been asked re repeatedly over the last year or two is to take a look at issuing CDs on programmatic BOs. And um, actually, next slide, please. So there's a, there are numerous programmatic federal BOs that cover restoration projects, and uh, this is slide just lists three of them that we've worked with in the past. Um, the NOAA Restoration Center's um, programmatic BO for the jurisdictional area for the Arcata office, for the Santa Rosa office, and then for the Central Valley of California. This is not an exhaustive list, but 
these are three that we have been looking at uh, recently and working with NOAA on. So we've been in some re very recent discussions with NOAA staff, and they are very interested in working with us to help figure out how we can facilitate issuance of CDs on the programmatic BOs. So right now, both of us are looking at our authority and our requirements to try to figure out how much flexibility we have so that we could um, start issuing more CDs off of these programmatic BOs. And we're hoping and pretty uh, optimistic that we'll be able to remove the few obstacles that there are and start issuing CDs much more easily and, and maybe a little bit more quickly on these um, PBOs. So the, the process that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, we've, we've set up what's a very simple process to uh, work through these programmatic BOs. This could apply to any programmatic BO from NOAA or from Fish and Wildlife Service, as long as the BO and the ITS have the necessary language we need to link it up and make sure the requirements of CSO are met. Uh, next slide, please. So before we go into you know, some of the obstacles and some of the, the, the way we've uh, found for trying to get around them, I wanted to take a minute or two just to review the CD process, since some of you may not have had occasion to work with it before. So anybody who receives an ITS or ITP from either NOAA Fisheries or the Fish and Wildlife Service can request a consistency determination or CD uh, from our director by making a written request and including a copy of the ITS um, along with the BO. Section 2080.1 of our code, which is the section that governs consistency determinations, does also require the payment of applicable fees but under our fee statute for CESA, there are no required fees for CDs if it's a voluntary habitat restoration project. So within 30 days of receipt of this notice, the director's office sends it out to the applicable region to review, and their job is to determine whether the ITS that's been issued by the um, federal agency is uh, consistent with this chapter, is the language, and the chapter means CESA. So we have to look at it and determine whether the, um, the conditions that the federal agency has set up um, are consistent with what we would need to do to permit under um, CESA. And then once we've made that determination, it's the, the permittee is notified and then it's published in the California Regulatory Notice Register. One really important thing to remember about consistency determinations is that the department cannot add or remove any terms from the ITS and the BO. We have to take it as is. So we get the document, we cannot add anything or delete anything. So if if the if NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service hasn't included something that's critical to meeting CESA compliance, then we won't be able to issue the CD. And this is why um, if you've worked with us on CDs before, you probably have heard our staff say over and over again, please consult with us and involve us as early as possible. And with the programmatic BOs, we're, we're working on a way to, to do that as well. So uh, next slide. So we have encountered a couple problems in issuing CDs on programmatic BOs. And some of these are actually problems that we just have generally with um, biological opinions of all kinds. And some of them are a little more unique to the programmatic ones. Um, the first thing is there's nothing in CESA that allows us to issue a programmatic CD. Um, we have to be able to find that the ITS is consistent with CESA, and we can't really do that until we've seen the project-specific information, which is never going to be in the programmatic BO itself. It comes in that later stage. So in the absence of that information, for example, we can't make a determination that there won't be jeopardy resulting from the authorized activities. Um, but even if there was a programmatic CD, we would still have to do a review of the project specific application, just like NOAA does, just like the US Fish and Wildlife Service does. So we would still be a two step process. And then when deciding whether to issue a CD, the statute says that we are supposed to look at the ITS and only the ITS. That means we're not even supposed to actually look at the text of the biological opinion itself. And this is often a stumbling block for us because many of the terms and conditions for the project are actually set forward in the BO, and they aren't always repeated or incorporated by reference into the ITS. However, again, during our discussions with NOAA recently, we asked and they confirmed what we thought was probably the case, which is when they issue uh, take authorization through an ITS, that take authorization is contingent on the project being completed as described in the BO and perhaps in the BA as well. 
And so even though they don't explicitly incorporate all the conditions of the BO into the ITS, that coverage is still contingent on completing those requirements. And so that's the kind of linkage that we need to be able to say that the um, ITS complies with CISA, even if it doesn't include all those conditions. And so one of the things we're doing right now is working with NOAA to, to ensure that future programmatic biological opinions include that language that links it up that way and makes it clear that the take coverage is contingent on completing the project as described in the BO. And we're also in discussions right now uh, to explore options for how to amend or supplement some of the existing programmatic biological opinions so that we don't have to wait till the next time they, they do a brand new um, PBO. So for the exact same reason, the ITS and, and or the BO also needs to include some kind of explanation of the process for getting that project specific application and approval. And some of the programmatic biological opinions contain extensive procedural discussions of how you get the project specific application. Some of them have been a little more sparing in the details in that. So that's another thing we're currently working with NOAA to ensure that future programmatic biological opinions have that and we're trying to figure out if we can amend or supplement the existing ones so that we can work with them uh, you know, very soon. So next slide. So what we've tried to come up with is a very simple process for trying to work through this. And a lot of this is very similar to what we do with other, um, to, with other uh, CD requests, but a little bit of it is specific to programmatic BOs. So either during, ideally we'd be involved in working with NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service while they're developing the programmatic biological opinion and we'd have some input and be able to give them some feedback on it. And hopefully then we could get whatever we need in that biological opinion, um, assuming that it's something that the, the, the federal agencies are comfortable putting in there at the outset. If not, then as soon after issuance as possible, we will review each of these programmatic BOs for restoration. And we'll be reviewing it for general consistency with CISA. We wanna make sure that we, the types of projects that they're gonna authorize under this programmatic BO are projects we could authorize under CISA. We wanna make sure that the terms and conditions in the BO generally line up with types of terms and conditions we would need to permit a project under CISA. We won't have the project specific details, but we'll have the general classes of projects and the general classes of conditions to look at. So we'll work, and then if we see inconsistencies, we would obviously work with the, the whichever federal agency to try to iron those out. But assuming we don't, or assuming we can resolve those problems, then what we will do is establish an internal mechanism for logging the results of this review. So we're gonna do this sort of unofficial review and approval of the programmatic BO at that general level. And then we're gonna log that and make that available to our staff who work on the CD requests. And that way, when somebody, when somebody is working on a project and they're looking to get a CD from us based on a programmatic BO, they will bring to us that request for the CD. They'll give us the ITS and the programmatic BO. And then they'll also give us that project specific application and approval they get from NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service. We will then take that, and at that point, when we send it out to our regional staff to review, they don't need to do another review of the programmatic BO because we've already kind of pre-approved it. And so all they're going to be looking at is, did the project-specific application follow the appropriate process and line up the correct um, project conditions based on what's in the BO? Well, that's exactly the same inquiry that NOAA is going to be doing when they look at a project specific application. So by the time you get to us and request a CD, all we're going to have to do is that very simple inquiry, knowing that NOAA has already done the identical inquiry and come to the conclusion that you qualify. And so we're hoping to reduce this to what would be an almost ministerial process at the department. And we're, this may result in a very small increase in or a decrease in the amount of time it takes us to issue a CD. I will say that since we only get 30 days as is and there's multiple layers of approval we have to get through, we can't shave too much time off that 30 days. But what we can do and what I think is more important um, for ensuring that we can issue CDs is have a much greater certainty. Um, so when somebody comes to us with a CD request, 
as long as they know that we've already kind of pre-approved that programmatic BO, they have a high degree of certainty that we're going to come to the same conclusion that NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service did, and that they're in fact going to get their CD request. So it should allow people to plan much better and to get much greater um, certainty in terms of it. So this is just one of those ways in which we're trying to figure out how to work with programmatic options for the department. And we're extremely thankful that uh, NOAA Fisheries has been you know, eager and very willing to talk to us about this and you know, to try to adjust some of their practices to help us uh, make this work. So that's all I have on programmatic BOs and CDs. That's great, Steve. Thank you very much for that. So we're at kind of a stopping point where we can look at some questions. I know we have a lot in the chat. Uh, I know there's folks on the phone who cannot see uh, what we're looking at, so we will figure out a way to get to you uh, to address questions. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, you, you wouldn't like to type it, you can use uh, the raise hand feature, uh, you can see a screenshot there on the screen. Little hand, if you uh, click on that, it'll tell me uh, who has their hand in the air and I can call on you. Uh, otherwise, you can feel free to use the chat window. Uh, a lot of folks have already done so, so I'm going to go back up and see if we can work our way through some of these questions that we have not touched upon yet. Matt, Matt, Steve, I know you were looking Matt, at. Chad, go say, ahead. Yeah, I want to say maybe we stopped around the 148 mark. I don't know if that's helpful. I think we were capturing most of them up until there. Yeah, we we address, we were talking about RMPs. Um, let's see, um, Steve. I don't think we addressed. Uh, there's a question here from from Carrie Lukasik. I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name about. Uh, whether or not regional water boards upcoming programmatic EAR for the new general order uh, can be used to meet CEQA requirements for issuance of an RMP for specific project or for multiple projects within the same watershed. Yeah, I, so I, um, th this is an important question to, to um, talk about. I, I want to be um, appropriately <laughs> cautious because we haven't seen the the um, public draft of that of that programmatic EIR, certainly the final draft. So we can't say anything absolutely definitive. But from what we know about the development of that programmatic EIR, yes, absolutely, we are very optimistic that it's going to be a document that people can use for um, all sorts of restoration projects and for use of the RMP. Um, so I think, and it it can also be something that we can use, um, could be used for multi-project permitting through the RMP, which I think was part of Kerry's question. So yes, absolutely. And that goes that the same is true for any kind of programmatic CEQA document. I mean, the, the water boards is going to be a very important one. There may be other ones that exist now or that will be developed in the future. And those are an ideal way to deal with the CEQA side of this permitting. And yes, the RMP should be able to line up, should be able to line up quite well with those. Okay. Next question, could an RMP be developed for restoration projects identified as part of the salmon habitat restoration priorities process that are similar in scope and within a region? Uh, yes. There you yes, go. absolutely. We talked about the, the title zone question uh, from Dylan's segment. Um, we talked about programmatic coverage for non FRGP funded projects. Um, follow up question. Let's see for Dylan. Uh, why not expand the Coastal Commission statewide CD with NOAA RC rather than seek a CDP for just one RGP? Yeah, so we have, we're in talks every week with NOAA and NOAA's RC about this and one of the reasons why we're looking at doing our own CDP is that to a consistency determination that's for federal agencies and they NOAA would then have to claim FRGP projects as their own for us to be able to use that CD whereas using a coastal development permit that can be used by state agencies and it would still stay under FRGP as the prom 
the, pe the person responsible for the projects. So Thank that's why I asked him about it, but we figured this would be an easier way to go. And, and, and Bob, um, I saw your hand raised. You, you probably have something to say on this one. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, we have covered FRGP projects in the past, but like Dylan mentioned, once uh, we put it under our uh, programmatic consistency determined, essentially the project is federalized and um, we bear all responsibility for things that go potentially wrong there. So we've been very uh, cautious as to kind of which projects we take on under that because we need to have provided a lot of technical assistance in there. And we have provided a lot of technical assistance to FRGP design projects where we were in at the ground floor helping, uh, you know, shape that project and help develop potential monitoring plans and whatnot. And those are the ones that we have typically put under there. But um, I'm interested in hearing more at some point in time, Dylan, offline about uh, how, how you guys are going with that state process. But that's typically how we've been working it. Great. Thank, thank you, Bob, and, and thank you, Dylan, uh, both for for addressing that. And just to kind of reiterate, uh, Dylan, as as the lead regulatory uh, person for FRGP, is is in constant coordination and contact with NOAA, um, not just once a year when we uh, do this process, but it's it's an ongoing dialogue between our between our offices on on a lot of topics like this. Um, moving on. In the cutting the green tape report, page 18, there is a proposal that effort that oh that RFGP will cover all such projects, not those, not just those funded by FRGP. Or I think they're asking again, well, can non-FRGP funded projects be covered uh, through that CEQA document? Um, and I think that's in reference to the cutting the green tape update from. Um, uh, agency secretary that that outlined some recommendations from that effort, one of which was to expand that coverage uh, that is uh, provided through FRGP to projects uh, funded uh, by uh, alternative uh, means. So that is a recommendation that that's on the table and it's uh, a recommendation that we're looking into in terms of feasibility and how that would roll out. Uh, given sort of the, the existing process for, for FRGP and how that might be applied to other ecosystems. Um, so that, that is something that is, that is being um, pursued as an option for sure. Um, next question, Steve, could you explain what projects under programmatic biops don't have to pay the fees? Is there more information on voluntary restoration project permitting the CD permit fee is very cost prohibitive for many of the small projects NRCS helps fund. Yeah, so um, I, I wasn't personally involved in the, the drafting and adoption of our CESA fee statute, but what I can, so I, I don't know everything about the intent in there. What I can tell you is that most of the time when you see the word voluntary um, referring to some sort of project in our code, what it really means is not mitigation. So usually voluntary, a voluntary uh, restoration project would be a restoration project that you are not regulatorily required to do. You're not doing it as mitigation for a development project of some kind. So I think having, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on federal programmatic biops and everything they cover, but the ones that we've looked at that are primarily for restoration purposes, these are typically not for um, mitigation for development projects. And so most of the projects that I assume uh, NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service are permitting under their programmatic BOs would be ones that would fall into this voluntary restoration project permitting. And certainly the types of things that NRCS is working on, as far as I know, are pretty much never gonna be mitigation for development projects. So I think they would probably all qualify for that fee waiver. Great. Okay. Next question from Jim Robbins. Can you talk about the level of engagement coordination uh, within CDW in the development of forthcoming PBO for aquatic restoration projects? 
Hi, this is Brad Henderson, and I, I believe this document is the statewide um, PBO that's being developed in support of the uh, programmatic EIR. And if that's the case, yes, we, we did take a look at that. Um, the measures for the BA about a year ago, we had several people in kind of an early version of the cutting green tape team um, review um, those, those avoidance and minimization measures. Um, but I certainly think if, if there's an opportunity to take another look at it, that could be a really good thing. And then who is CDFW working with at NOAA regarding the programmatic restoration BOs? I don't know if we know that. So, so currently um, we're working with, with Bob, who's on this call, and, um, and then also we've just started reaching out to uh, Ruth Goodfield with the NOAA Restoration Center on another um, opportunity that we're looking at as one of the pilot projects, and we'll actually get to that a little bit more in the case studies. Great. Thanks, Brad. Dylan, I think this one's for you. Uh, can you elaborate on the reference to the thousand linear foot limitation in the RGP for FRGP? Does this apply to a specific region, RGP, or all projects under FRGP? Yeah, so currently um, all three of our regional general permits have limits at 500. You can't just dewater or disturb more than 500 contiguous feet. Um, with RGB 12's renewal, so inland portion of San Luis Obispo County to Oregon border, we are looking to increase that to 1,000 feet. So once that is authorized, we will have where 78 and 16 are still limited to 500 feet for the time being, and RGB 12 has been increased to 1,000, but currently it's for the whole program. Great. And then next question, what area does the 404 Regional General Permit 16 cover? Yeah, so RGB 16 covers the range of salmon and steelhead habitat in the Central Valley, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and the Sassoon Bay. And that covers roughly around 20 portions of 27 counties in California. So it's a little long to list out, but you can find that permit as a link inside of the current proposal solicitation notice, which is on the FRGP website. Um, I think also if you just Google Regional General Permit 16, it should be like one of the searches on Google. Great. And don't go away. What does the 4040 uh, permit uh, region cover? Just lost. Uh, it. Looks like it's the same one. It just adds a zero. Oh. They're still talking about 16. Scrolling on me. OK. Um, is there a standard definition for restoration projects that universally qualify for these permitting advantages and distinguishes restoration projects from development projects. Is there consideration of a long-term team at CDFW headquarters to facilitate these accelerated restoration permitting measures? Great question. So as to the first part, there, there is no standard definition of restoration projects. Um, that, is, that is one of the many things that we have at least toyed with the idea of doing if we get the chance to do a rulemaking on this to actually draw that line um, uh, much more sharply. And one of the reasons is there have historically been a lot of folks out there um, from the development community that have tried to stuff mitigation projects into a restoration context so that they can benefit from some of the streamlining, some of the fee waivers, and some of those other advantages. And we're just trying to maintain a sharp line so that we, anything that's a true restoration project, you know, gets those advantages and the mitigation projects that don't need them don't. Um, but right now we don't have uh, a very solid definition. So it's something we have to kind of look at case by case. Usually it's fairly obvious if something is qualifying for, if something is being used for mitigation purposes, and that's usually um, as close to a dividing line we have. Um, and then in terms of a long-term team, um, we haven't quite figured that out right now. I mean, right now we have this restoration permitting team that Brad and I are co-leading, and we will be working on these pilot projects to try to test the RMP, and we will be do working on some other things. Um, there has been discussion of the idea of having a permitting strike team that would operate statewide. There are some advantages to that in the sense that you get a small team of people that have great familiarity with the tools, but you also sometimes then lose all of the regional expertise that our regional office has. And then there's sort of a hybrid where you have, you know, you do have a statewide team that comes expert in using those tools and they work in conjunction with the local regional staff. 
And so none of those decisions have been made at this point. Um, and part of it really depends, and uh, Chad may want to say more about this, but part of it, I think, depends on whether we have funding and staffing beyond the rest of this fiscal year. Right now, we don't have the resources to actually establish that kind of team. But if we get ongoing funding and staffing, uh, I think that's at least part of the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Steve. This this is Chad again for those that joined after I was introduced. Um, so we, we the whole intent of this first year pilot year effort, if you will, one time funding was to really dive in deeply and see if we can create some tools that will be long lasting and that we can uh, apply some efficiencies in the grant process and the permitting process, develop new tools and permits, um, look at new things within the granting world, get more specific and think about how they'll have some short term immediate actions, but also that long term piece. Since right now we don't have funding uh as it looks on the outset right on the out years and this is a one-time effort that we've redirected our staff um we're really focused on really just trying to create the tools and, and see if these things will work and and do have some legs uh the intent is to carry them over as we can and as applicable um we will definitely try and do that and and we're just going to have to see at the end of the year how this looks for us um, which things seem like they can apply over. They are efficiencies. They are things we can continue with our existing staff and sending all of these folks that are on this call today back to their day jobs, if you will, to some extent. Um, but I also think it's, it brings up a good point where I would ask you as the stakeholders to do what you need to do uh, in your arenas and talk to the powers that be in your land um, and, and make those recommendations to the secretary, to the, to the legislative folks um, that you know and deal with. If you like what you see and, and you like what we're trying to do, uh, those are great compliments that we would welcome at any point to ensure that the conversation continues and that we can continue to figure out how we can fund this long term within the state and really give the department the capacity that we need to make sure that these continue as well as continue other advances. Uh, we know there's more on the table. We've seen the report that uh, came out of the secretary with the Landscape um, Stewardship Network and the additional comments that we have just in our general dialogue. So we're all hands on deck trying to tackle this and we have an interest to carry it on. The reality is we have the money we have and the staffing we have. So the goal is to take as many uh, things on as we can within this year and see what we can apply long term and hope that we can continue uh, not only these tools that we develop, but more into the future. But we need some help from you on that end. So with that, I think it answers the question. But I'm always looking for folks to to put a plug in for the department for the work we're doing, because I know our staff are working really hard. And I'm just really proud of everything that you've seen so far today and, and the, the accomplishments we've made in such a short time um, with some really talented staff that know what they're doing. Great. Thank you, Chad. Um, We'll go ahead and move on to the next question in the queue here. Can you share some examples of CDFW safe harbor agreements for or consistency terminations with federal safe harbor agreements that cover fish? I can uh, give you a couple examples. This is Brad again. Um, uh, one of these isn't isn't a fin fish, but we've done, I believe, two consistency determinations on federal safe harbor agreements for Shasta crayfish which is a critically endangered uh, native crayfish to California um, that occurs in Shasta County. Um, and so that's, that is actually our, our very first uh, uh, SHA consistency determination, I believe, was one of those projects. And those, those two projects um, were uh, basically um, uh, taking Shasta crayfish from places where they were uh, threatened and putting them into safer habitats um, in one case, in a private pond on on some folks' land, and in the other case, on to PG&E property. And so, then one other example that we've been working on for quite a while is is a kind of a large scale safe harbor agreement that covers um, well over 20 miles on the Upper Shasta River in Siskiyou County, and we'll hit that on the uh, one of the case studies as well. Uh, and there's going to be 13 consistency determinations, hopefully for uh, for this effort. And it's it's sort of a hybrid hybrid between a programmatic safe harbor and individual safe harbor agreements. And so that's something that's uh, just now wrapping up. I believe that uh, NOAA signed the permits just last week. And I am sure there will be more to come. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Marianne, hopefully that's helpful. If not, we can follow up. Um, 
Next question, curious about the distinction between voluntary restoration and mitigation. As a practitioner, this is not black and white. Many voluntary, voluntary project landowner is volunteering to do good work are funded partially or completely with mitigation and or settlement funds. Can you talk about how CDFW is distinguishing the difference between the two? Is it about project applicant or funding source? Um, again, this is Steve again. So again, we don't have a strict definition. So we have to look at these on a case by case basis and make a call on it because we don't have a general rule that applies here. Um, most of the time, if something's being funded with mitigation dollars, then we're generally going to look at that as a not a voluntary project, but as a um, development oriented mitigation project. And if there are fees that are associated that that um, you normally wouldn't want to charge to a restoration project, the expectation would be the developer who, who's getting the mitigation credit for that will be providing those fees. And if they're not, then something's probably gone wrong with the process. Um, but that's not necessarily always the case. There may be situations in which some mitigation fees could be used, and it may still qualify as a voluntary restoration project. So again, it's a case-by-case -case determination. Um, settlement funds get a lot trickier, and there's there's um, situations where th those are uh, more likely to qualify, I think, as um, voluntary restoration projects than ones with straight mitigation dollars. But but again, there's there's no hard and fast rules here. And that's one of the things that we'd like to be able to. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how we will do it if we do get the chance to do a rulemaking, but um, it would be nice to pin it down because you're right. It's not black and white and um, and we worry about our own consistency from case to case because it it is sometimes hard to distinguish um, different types of projects in this way. Thanks, Steve. And, and Eric Schmidt, that, that might cover your follow up question to Jim's about, you know, isn't mitigation enabled restoration just restoration with a different funding source? And why not cover these projects as efficiently as grant funded projects um, could be tailored to mitigation bank projects to start? Um, Steve, I don't know if you have anything to add to, to that follow up. Yeah, I mean, not not really anything other than what we've already said, I think. Right. OK. So then I'll back up. Uh, Madeline, you're right. I missed um, Tim Ryan's question from earlier. I apologize, Tim. Could an RMP be used to authorize the lethal take of an invasive novel species for the benefit of another species, e.g. lethal removal of barred owls for the benefit of spotted owls? So I, I think the answer here, I want to I, I want to um, tread a little bit carefully with this one because I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be pre-decisional about anything about a particular project or anything. So I'm just going to talk about can an RMP itself um, be used to authorize the intentional lethal take of a species for the benefit of another one, um, leave aside the barred owls and spotted owls thing. Um, I think in general, yes, it can probably. Um, the the restrictions in 2081A, for example, um, it, it's not limited just to uh, incidental take or accidental take or anything like that. It can include intentional take for that purpose. Again, you just have to make sure you're fitting in with those purposes um, that for the different stat, depending on which statute you need authorization under, that you fall within that purpose. So yes, I mean, if you had to take even a fully protected species for the benefit of a species, species listed species, in theory, that is something that could be done under a fully protected MOU as well. So yes, I think in, in concept, yes, this can be done. Whether it can be done with those particular species and in a particular context is something we'd have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Great. Hopefully that works. Okay, uh, we got a couple more questions. Um, what happens if a restoration project tries to go through the new RMP process but doesn't finish within the year 2021? If we start one, for example, these pilot projects, if we start them, we're going to finish them regardless of what happens to the cutting the green tape funding. I mean, once we start that process, we're committing to you know doing our best to get that project permitted under that. And um, and we'll figure out some way to make that work. We're, we probably won't take on a lot more than the um, pilot projects until we know what our long-term funding situation is, though. Okay. But for example, if you are 
if, if you are one of the stakeholders that we contact in the next few weeks and say, hey, you've got this project that we think looks really good for the RMP, um, you don't have to worry about the change that'll happen at the end of the fiscal year, depending on our funding. We will we will see the project permitting through no matter what. Okay. And then one more question. Uh, Caltrout's Cedar Creek project, a fish passage project currently in design, funded through FRGP, is seeing a permitting pathway that would allow heavy equipment working in stream after fish removal to achieve considerable implementation cost savings. Our hope would be to have sequel coverage from FRGP MND and perhaps pursue an individual 401 water quality cert. Is this feasible? Is it feasible to obtain CDFW permitting staff participation in a regulatory strategy development program? Should I email my request or can I reach out to individual staff? So, well, if you got all that, Dylan, or Steve. I did. Hey, Darren, hope you're well. Um, with the Cedar Creek project, short answer potentially. Um, obviously, the project is complex, so I would suggest reaching out to me and we have this discussion offline. But yes, there is a way that projects funded under FRGP could use our CEQA coverage, but then decide that they don't want to use, let's say, our 404 or a 401. That is a possibility. Um, but it all just, it's, project by project basis. So we'd need to talk more at depth about that. And then I believe the second question would more go to Brad, because I think he's talking about the RPM. Yeah, and just uh, one point, we've, we've uh, made a request to set up this restoration permitting um, email um, address. It is not set up yet, as far as I know, unless they just got it set up uh, during this meeting, but we're hoping to have that up and running um, by Monday. And so um, I think, you know, if you're participating in this meeting right now, feel free to reach out um, to, to us via this link um, and we can, um, you know, we'd be more than happy to talk with you about your project. And uh, we may then refer you to uh, regional staff um, if that's, if it seems like that's the best way to go, um, we can, you know, we can uh, connect you with the right folks. Great. Thanks, Brad. Okay, one more question, and I think we're going to get back into the uh, next portion of the presentation. Uh, the SHRP HERA relationship has been very effective for permitting small habitat restoration. Will there be a similar relationship for a CDFW permitting pathway to go with the upcoming State Water Board General Order and programmatic EIR for large scale restoration? Would it be just a standard LSA plus an RMP? I think for the time being, that's that's probably true. Um, uh, with you know, and of course, we we still haven't seen, as Steve mentioned, the uh, the draft uh, public draft or final um, programmatic EIR. But we do have very high hopes for that program, um, and so um, and so for the moment, it's it's very likely that it would be a standard LSA for an aquatic project or or a terrestrial project that has some aquatic component, um, and then depending on the needs of the project and RMP. Um, could be the right fit. Um, it may also be a CD on a programmatic, just depending on the project specifics. So that that does sound like a likely scenario. Great, thank you. Um, I know we have uh, quite a few folks on the phone, maybe um, who are not on a computer. Um, you should be able to unmute yourselves if you are so inclined to ask a question. I know you can't use the chat or raise your hand, uh, so feel free. I'm not able to unmute folks who are on the phone, so if you would like to speak and, and ask a question, uh, feel free. And if you're not able to, I uh, apologize and um, we can follow up later. See, you might try using star six to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll give it a second here. We're gonna start back in with our presentation. Um, we are right on schedule. So we're gonna go through some different case studies 
Um, but before that, we can we can also take a quick break if folks feel like they need to stretch their legs or check email. Um, we can do that too. Yeah, how about a five minute break? That's a good idea. We'll see you in five minutes, folks. Okay, we're going to go ahead and continue on our journey. Um, next segment is we're going to look at uh, uh, several case studies uh, in, in, in permitting. Uh, Brad Henderson, along with Jennifer Olson, are going to walk us through some of these. So, Brad, I think you're up uh, first. I am. Thanks, Matt. 
And so, hi everybody, it's really great to be doing this today. I'm really excited and uh, great participation from everyone. So thanks for that. Uh, my name is Brad Henderson. I'm a senior uh, environmental scientist supervisor in uh, CDFW's northern region. And I'm also the co-lead of the cutting green tape permitting team. And so we're going to focus on, on three um, case studies, really looking at permitting solutions rather than the specifics of the projects, although we will hit on that. Um, and we're going to look at a small project that, um, that has an HREA and Safe Harbor Agreement component. And then we'll look at a large project uh, that was too large to fit within the SHARP HREA limits. And, uh, and that project used the uh, Restoration Management Permit solution. And then back to a, a future small project, um, which would be a CD on a programmatic biological opinion. And there'll be uh, time, hopefully, for a few questions along the way as we discuss each permitting approach. Next slide, please. OK, so this case study involves a restoration project within a one and a half mile reach of the upper Shasta River, but below Dwinnell Dam, also known as Lake Shastina in Siskiyou County. The project site is also part of a much larger ongoing safe harbor agreement process that's um, designed to benefit coho salmon. So work was proposed on two private cattle ranches. The project was a design build aquatic habitat enhancement project funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. The project was implemented by California Trout with assistance from Montague Water Conservation District, the property owners, uh, the ranch owners, and an experienced design implementation team. HREA permitting allowed the project to be permitted and completed in a relatively short time frame during 2019. Next slide, please. This is an aerial view of the project reach. Uh, Dwinell Dam can be seen in the lower right side of the image, and the green patches are largely irrigated pastures. Um, one of the ranches here um, diverts water. Uh, from the uh, from the Shasta River, as well as from some springs as well. You can see kind of a, a little pond in the upper left hand corner, and that becomes important a little later on um, as we talk about some of the project components. The Shasta River historically supported more salmon habitat than it does today, but it's still considered an essential waterway for coho recovery. A watershed scale federal and state safe harbor agreement process is currently under development and uh, the feds just signed their permits last week. Uh, the safe harbor agreement was designed to contribute to the recovery of coho salmon by implementing a comprehensive and long term strategy. The strategy includes water management actions by landowners to improve water quality and also landowners would be allowing access for habitat enhancement projects under the safe harbor agreement. Landowners would receive take authorization for ongoing agricultural activities while providing a net conservation benefit to coho salmon. The safe harbor agreement process helped facilitate taking immediate steps to improve coho salmon habitat within these reaches. The safe harbor agreement involves, as I mentioned before, uh, 14 entities in total, 13 of whom are, are uh, private ranches or irrigation districts, along with a broad range of other partners. Federal safe harbor agreements were developed and we anticipate CDFW consistency determinations. The project reach, a small portion of the entire safe harbor agreement area is just downstream of Dwinell Dam, as I mentioned, and exhibits reduced habitat complexity with both improved water quality and access for restoration projects provided by the safe harbor agreement. Oh, go ahead and hit the next slide, Matt. Here we go. So with both improved water quality and access for restoration provided by the Safe Harbor Agreement, additional fisheries improvements can be accelerated by improving spawning substrate, improving cover, increasing riparian shading, and creating off-channel rearing habitat. California Trout implemented several restoration actions within the project reach. Five riffles were constructed along with sp spawning gravel augmentation, 24 large woody debris structures were installed at several locations. A boulder curtain was constructed to enhance an existing cold water alcove and 100 woody riparian trees were planted. Next slide, please. 
The project constructed five riffle structures with an average riffle length of about 60 feet for each structure and a combined total length of 306 feet. The riffle structures were designed to provide stability in the channel bed to hold or capture spawning gravel in place. These riffles will add channel complexity to the reach, changing the reach from a long run to adding several pool riffle run features. This will provide spawning habitat and pool habitat for rearing salmonids. And as you see from the photo, dewatering was not a part of this project. Next slide, please. 50 juniper trees were used to construct root wad structures to increase pool depth and provide cover for rearing and migrating juvenile coho salmon. And again, approximately 100 willow trees were planted. Next slide, please. The project enlarged an existing cold water salmon rearing alcove receiving spring flows, and these spring flows were provided under a water exchange developed during the Safe Harbor Agreement development process. Willow poles and a boulder fence were installed to provide cover and to reduce mixing. So the alcove is on the right, and you can just see the tip of the boulder fence in the middle of the photo. Next slide, please. So as the photo shows, there's a potential for take. Um, and as the HREA permittee of California trout developed species protection measures for several species that have at least some potential for take. And of course, this includes coho salmon, a variety of nesting birds, uh, western pond turtles, and perhaps frogs and maybe other amphibians. And Amer American badger was also listed um, and had species protection measures developed. Uh, an LSA agreement would also normally be needed for this project. The total project area is 3.54 acres and would impact 494 linear feet of stream, which is within the limits of SHARP and HREA. We really like to see 499 linear feet of stream if you can swing that, but 494 is pretty good. Um, and finally, the project uh, was determined to be categorically exempt from CEQA under the Small Habitat Restoration um, CADEX uh, 15333, and of course, this, along with the other things we've mentioned, helps to reduce costs. Next slide, please. And I'm getting a delay unless you've already advanced the slide, Matt. There we go. OK. So this project, uh, you know, no surprises. This was a great fit for uh, Small Habitat Restoration General Order and the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act process. And in this case, it was under Fish and Game Code Section 1653, where the project proponent first uh, contacted the regional board. Uh, project work windows reduced the potential impacts, and hazing aquatic species from the work sites eliminated the need for dewatering, uh, simplifying implementation and reducing costs. A 30-day CD process replaced the need for separate CESA permits and LSA agreements. The permitting strategy allowed design, permitting, and implementation to occur in a relatively short time frame. Uh, this SHA process that I mentioned um, also facilitated landowner commitments, cooperation with overall restoration goals and uh, water quality and flows, and also provided um, landowner assurances related to the potential for increased coho use on these properties, which is what it's all about. So we can stop here for a question or two if anyone has one about this permitting strategy. See, uh, Brad, there's a couple in the chat. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, I can, I can see them. So the first one asks about how long development of the Safe Harbor Agreement took. Um, so in this case, um, the um, the safe harbor agreement has has been underdeveloped. It's a particularly complex one, and so I don't want to use this as an example um, for uh, it being quick. Um, however, um, in it, you know it took several years, um, but it it is um, very complex. It covers a large area, um, and and it's a part of the world that um, you know this is um, really going out on a limb and and uh, you know taking steps to recover a listed species is is really difficult. I will say um, for a simple safe harbor agreement, they they can be really quick, um, if, if especially if you have a single landowner and not a whole lot of coordination needs. Um, and the CD 
process has not yet started for this. The federal permits were just signed, and there's a, a few steps that need to occur between now and, and when we um, get and evaluate those CD requests, but they should all be complete this year. And the second uh, question um, asks, what was, uh, who was the primary agency for the categorical exemption? Um, wondering if this CE would be consistent in different counties and um, local jurisdictions. So the, the CD um, or the CEQA determination was made um, by the, um, the North Coast Regional Board because that's who you know, took the first action on the project and, and they determined that it was a fit under um, the Small Habitat Restoration General Order. And so when we do a CD like this, um, and that step has already taken place under 1653, we don't, um, we don't file a separate CD, or a, or a separate uh, notice of exemption, I'm sorry. And then I see that uh, Jake Shannon has um, included a link to the SHARP notice of applicability for this project as well. So if there aren't any other questions, um, we can, um, Turn this over, Matt, to, uh, oh, we got a question. Can you please state that HREA expires this year unless authorized and encourage uh, supporters to act? Uh, thank you, Mr. Weslow. Um, that is in reference to um, the fact that HREA itself uh, expires um, in 2022. I believe unless uh, reauthorized and there's currently um, legislation uh, to, to do so. That is correct and we yeah. are uh, absolutely asking for folks to encourage folks to support that. Uh, we understand there are some things in the works to try and do that uh, through a bill trying to analyze that and ensure that it's extended, so definitely asking for support there. The department is in support of it. Um, our HREA report is out. We did our five year legislative report and I believe that is out. Uh, perhaps we can put a link to that in the chat before the day's over um, where we can find that. We'll make that available to folks. That's right. And that is uh, Senate Bill 716 uh, and Sustainable Conservation has been involved with Senator McGuire's office as well to reauthorize the act. So thank you for yeah. Um, circling back to that, uh, Tom, I appreciate it. Yeah, we love HREA. And so I think that concludes uh, this case study. And uh, Matt will turn it over to Jennifer Olson to talk about uh, the very first restoration management permit. Yes, I will. Jennifer, are you ready to go there? Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Olson. Um, oh, I guess I'll wait until the slide comes up here. It's not for me. There we go. I'm John Olson. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the department. Um, also in the northern region, I'm in the Coastal Habitat Conservation Planning Group um, based out of the Eureka office. And I'm just going to give a brief overview here of the Cochrane Creek and Quail Slough Fish Passage and Habitat Enhancement Project. Um, and as Brad mentioned, this was actually the first project that the department permitted through the 2081A um, Restoration Management Permit Pathway. So just to get oriented, um, if you look at the smaller image on the far left of the screen, you can make out Humboldt Bay. And the project site is just east of Humboldt Bay, up here in Humboldt County, in between um, Eureka and Arcata. And then you can see in the larger yellow box here, um, the project site itself is on Cochrane Creek, which is a tributary to Fay Slough, uh, which then goes to Eureka Slough and then Humboldt Bay. And Cochrane Creek has about two miles of spawning and rearing habitat for Salmonids upstream of the project site. And then you can see Quail Slough running through uh, the center of the project site there. That's a trip to Cochrane Creek that um, is a smaller tributary. It doesn't provide spawning habitat, but it does provide uh, rearing and other habitat for salmonids and other aquatic organisms. And Cochrane Creek um, historically was habitat for coho, steelhead, and coastal cutthroat trout. The creek is currently um, relatively disconnected from its tidal habitats because of levees. And then there is a top hinged tide gate that is a fish passage barrier under most flow conditions. So um, that's an issue. And then additionally, there is some risk of fish stranding in the adjacent ag fields, which you can see um, the ag surroundings on the screen here. Um, and then we know from sporadic observations that someone occasionally make it past the tide gate and they have been observed in Cochrane Creek. 
All right, we can go to the next slide. So I apologize for the size of the um, overview image. Hopefully, if you have this on full screen, you can get a sense of what's going on here. But I'm going to describe it for you. So the project that was proposed, the restoration project, um, proposed to improve fish passage for salmonids, primarily via uh, replacing that top hinge tie gate with a more fish friendly side hinge tie gate. And then the project has many other components that will expand various habitat types on site, including um, a large riparian uh, revegetation component. Um, and some channel modification and a lot of different insect floodplains and backwater features and that sort of thing. And we can go to the next slide. And so the project proponents in this case are the property owners um, in collaboration with Caltrout and then the Coastal Ecosystems Institute of Northern California. And one other thing I forgot to mention about this project site is if you are um, local to the Humboldt Bay area and you've driven on Myrtle Avenue during the fall, um, the Organic Matters Ranch is where the, the giant pumpkin patch is. So that would be a good landmark for folks so you know where we're talking about. Um, and then the funding for this project was provided through a number of different sources, uh, the Coastal Conservancy, some CDFW Prop 1 funding, and then some funding from the Natural Resources Agency grant program as well. Next slide, please. So um, I touched on this briefly, but uh, some of the expected outcomes from the project are to provide improved access to that spawning anadromous salmonid spawning habitat that is upstream of the tide gate. And then it'll also improve uh, about 2000 feet of stream channel on the project site itself uh, by creating those different kinds of aquatic habitat features on Cochrane Creek and Quail Slough. And then additionally, to address that risk of um, fish stranding that we talked about, there will be some guide berms and just ways to keep fish um, in the channel and out of those egg fields under higher flow conditions. All right, next slide, please. And then additionally, uh, the project will improve floodplain habitats on site and create a pretty significant amount of new riparian habitat by uh, revegetation on site. We can go to the next slide. So in terms of uh, permitting needs from CDFW, the project did need to obtain a take authorization uh, pursuant to CESA for take of coho salmon that will occur during construction. Um, so that's primarily for capture and relocation of fish um, prior to in-stream work, uh, prior to dewatering. And then uh, the post-project monitoring that was proposed is to use baited minnow traps to capture juvenile salmonids and to assess um, use of that new and, and enhanced habitat. Next slide, please. So then in addition from CDFW, um, the project needed to obtain a lake or streambed alteration agreement that is for the restoration components that involve alteration of the bed bank and channel of these streams. And then the LSA, uh, we touched on this earlier, the LSA did authorize moving non-listed species out of harm's way during construction. So that would be non-listed fish that were also um, captured during the fish relocation. And then, you know, amphibians, we might have some northern red-legged frogs in the more um, freshwater riparian areas um, upstream on the, on the north, northeast side of the project. All right, we can go to the next slide. So then kind of other permitting um, needs, considerations, constraints, um, in contrast to the project that Brad just described, this is a relatively large project site. So it's clearly out of the bounds of, of what we would um, be able to look at for HREA. It doesn't fit into that class 33 small habitat restoration project exemption. Um, Humboldt County is lead agency to do an, a mitigated NAGDAC for this project um, in 2019. And we can go to the next slide. So we kind of looked at all those considerations and, you know, at that point, um, RMP almost didn't exist yet. It was a really new idea, but because this project was too big for HREA, um, it's not CEQA exempt, exempt. And as, as many of you know, it's often difficult for restoration projects to fit into some of the um, requirements of ITPs and CDs. As Steve mentioned earlier, those, those kinds of um, permits typically aren't a great fit for a lot of, of restoration projects. So, um, you know, Region 1 staff um, talked with headquarters staff and decided that, that um, RMP would be a good fit. And we decided to try it for this project. And um, I guess we can go to the next slide. 
which doesn't have much on it because I don't really have any um, any info or outcomes at this point. The permitting process I thought went really well. I, I do think this is a great fit for this project. Really happy to be um, involved in in one of the first uh, in the first project they've got to go through this process. But uh, we're going to construction this summer, so I'm interested to um, to see uh, what happens next and, and stay tuned. And I can answer I think a couple brief questions if we have time. So thanks, folks. Thank you, Jen. Uh, any questions on that? OK, well, we can uh, circle back to that at the end. Um, and we can move on to the next segment. Is that you, Brad? That's me. Thanks, Matt. And so for our final uh, case study, this is a, uh, a future project. Um, that uh, hasn't been permitted in a, at all. And it's, in fact, it's still being designed. Um, but we hope that, uh, that we can work on this during the cutting the green tape permitting pilot. So this uh, case study is for the Paynes Creek Fish Passage Project. And as I mentioned, it's currently in the final design phase. There's a picture of, I believe, the 90% design there. Um, and CDFW hopes to uh, issue this project a project-specific consistency determination using a programmatic biological opinion. And so this project was funded by Prop 1, and Trot Unlimited is the grantee. Uh, next slide, Matt. The project location is just uh, northeast of the town of Red Bluff in Tehama County, um, not far from the confluence of Paynes Creek with the Sacramento River. Uh, the project is also on uh, BLM land, which adds a, a little bit extra interagency coordination um, to, the, to the site. Next slide, please. The Paynes Creek project site is located at a water diversion facility that can be a physical barrier to upstream fish passage. Uh, that barrier is created by uh, an old flashboard diversion dam. In addition, there's a 3,000 linear foot unscreened irrigation canal uh, that can trap fish between the diversion and the fish screen located down the ditch. The goal of the project is to develop a design to restore fish passage at the diversion facilities and address uh, potential fish mortality associated with the unscreened irrigation canal while meeting the operational needs of the water users. Next slide, please. So the project's goal um, will, uh, or the project has committed to providing upstream and downstream fish passage for the target species. Um, during the migration windows and the, pr the project technical advisory committee has identified Fall Run Chinook, Central Valley Steelhead and Pacific Lamprey as our, our target species for passage. Um, in addition um, to these uh, main species that, that really do use Paynes Creek all the time, um, the stream may also support uh, non-natal rearing habitat for juvenile Winter Run Chinook um, which are both uh, Federal Endangered Species Act and CESA listed as endangered, and Spring Run Chinook, which are both Federal Endangered Species Act and CESA listed as threatened. And so we've heard a little bit already today about, uh, you know, what happens when you have duly listed species and the types of things that we can do. So we have, we have those two for this project. Next slide, please. So the preferred alternative includes construction of a rough and rock ramp at the diversion site and an on-channel cone fish screen. This photo shows an example of a rough and rock ramp recently constructed for another fish, process, fish passes project nearby into Hama County. Next slide, please. So along with the cone screen, the design also includes piping the diversion canal and installing um, a facility to house the cone screen. Uh, to keep fish in Paynes Creek and out of the diversion ditch. And this is just an example of a, of a cone screen, if you haven't seen one. Next slide, please. So we have a few species um, that are duly listed, as I mentioned, that may be captured and relocated uh, during project work. Um, and again, winter run Chinook, spring run Chinook. Um, in addition to the duly listed species, um, we have other fish, including uh, the federally listed Central Valley steelhead, 
uh, pond turtles and whatever else might be in the stream. Uh, an LSA agreement will be needed for the project. Uh, the work area, unfortunately, exceeds the limits of the small habitat restoration general order because of the linear um, foot um, of stream impacts. So in this case, we can't go down that, that road, uh, which um, as we were working through potential cutting the green tape solutions, we thought, what about uh, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps taking a look at this project um, for a potential CD. Um, and so another um, thing that uh, happened resulting from the project not being able to go through the SHARP uh, program is that uh, there really wasn't a CEQA document being prepared. And in fact, there wasn't a CEQA lead agency even identified um, at that point in time. And, um, and so one of the things that's um, nice about uh, a CD um, because we're not issuing a permit, we're just making a determination is that we can do that without having to rely on a, a CEQA environmental document. So that's uh, one other thing that, uh, that made us think this could be a good fit. Um, and then finally, um, Federal Endangered Species Act take um, for this project. Um, the, the plan is to authorize that take via uh, NOAA Restoration Center's uh, Central Valley programmatic um, ITS biological opinion. Next slide, please. So therefore, this is a, a potential fit for a project-specific consistency determination using the Central Valley programmatic. Uh, the CD would address winter run and spring run Chinook. Um, you would also, you could also note that a, a restoration management permit could also work for this project, uh, but the CD is probably a little more streamlined. Uh, we expect that the CD option will work better for some projects and the RMP may work better for others. Um, it just depends on the specifics of each project. Uh, for example, if uh, take authorization is needed for a CESA listed species um, that is not duly listed, you know, not also listed under ESA, uh, the RMP then becomes a better option for everyone. Uh, but with a CD, this is a, a very quick process. Um, and again, it's a 30 day process. There is no fee for voluntary restoration projects. And as Steve mentioned previously, the LSA agreement can authorize moving the non CESA listed animals out of harm's way, such as pond turtles or even Central Valley steelhead. Next slide, please. So this is just a very simple diagram of how this project could work as well as, as others that we may, um, we, we may look at uh, doing project specific CDs in the future. And it's a really exciting prospect. So um, as Steve previously uh, discussed in his presentation about CDs, um, CDFW would review uh, NOAA's Central Valley programmatic biological opinion in advance. And when making the CD request, the applicant would provide uh, CDFW with the programmatic biop itself, the applicant's project specific application to NOAA, and NOAA's project specific approval. CDFW would not have to go back and review the program programmatic biological opinion again, and we can make our, our CD determination based on the project specific application and NOAA's written approval. Uh, this process again would largely achieve the goals of programmatic permitting, which is really exciting. Um, so I think we can we can pause now and uh, see if there's any questions on the uh, case study. So we have a question in the chat. Can you please explain again the difference between the LSA and the RMP and how CDFW staff determine when to use LSA or RMP? Right. So. Um, so I, I guess if a project, um, let's just say a restoration project was working in, in the dry and seasonal stream and they are able to time the work um, where there, there would be you know, uh, no interactions with, with uh, sea solicited species or fully protected species or maybe even you know, common or um, species of special concern, that could be an, an example where the um, lake or stream bed alteration um, agreement by itself could be all you need for a project. But if any of those other components come in, then you that may change things. So if there was a, um, a need just to move common um, fish or common amphibians 
um, or species of special concern, that could also be covered by an LSA. But if you get into the realm of, of impacting fully protected species or sea solicited species, that's where the RMP might be uh, might be the right tool. Um, or if it's um, going to just be duly listed species, uh, then the CD might be the right tool. Okay. Let's see. Uh, thank you, Maddie. There's a overview of LSA, uh, a link there in the chat if folks want to refer to that. Uh, we got another question. Because of BLM, did the Payne's Creek project have a NEPA component? Would that potentially impact the CD? That's a good question. And uh, and yes, there, there will be a NEPA component. And so um, it, it doesn't really impact the CD. Um, however, uh, a NEPA document could give us the option of, of using uh, that NEPA document or give us or any lead agency the, the opportunity to use the NEPA document as uh, CEQA compliance for the project. So that was something that um, you know is still an option for this project if if it's determined that uh, the CD isn't the right pathway and we, we need to do something else. Uh, there may be a way to do that utilizing the NEPA document, but there's um, you know not really any um, real nexus between um, NEPA and ESA in terms of, of us being able to do a CD. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? I know there was a, a question that, that Steve already addressed, but I'll read it if folks can catch it. Uh, someone had asked to clarify uh, if the RMP program is still on a pilot stage and what is the likely program expansion after the first year. And um, as, as Steve pointed out, uh, it's, it is still in the pilot phase. Um, Cochrane Creek was the project through which we developed the initial template, uh, which has been uh, modified su substantially. And we're hoping to test the new RMP with three to five projects over the next six to 10 months. Assuming the pilot projects showed it to be a useful tool, we will continue to use it beyond the end of this fiscal year. Um, part of this hinges upon our department's ability to uh, acquire additional funding to support uh, cutting the green tape. This is a one year uh, program supported by one time funds. So um, obviously, if we're able to continue with additional funding, we can we can ramp up programs, programs like this. Otherwise, uh, we still would like to, to put effort there, uh, but it's probably going to move along at a, at a slower pace. Yeah, and Matt, if I could just add to that, this is Steve, if yeah. I could just add to that real quick. For, for both the RMP, which is a new tool, and for this new process that Brad and I both discussed about working with programmatic BOs, you know, th those are things that the department's going to try to continue to do regardless of whether we get additional funding for cutting the green tape moving forward. They just, they're good tools, we think, they make sense, and they will we'll, we'll find a way to make use of them either way. The real difference is just if we get the additional funding and are actually able to establish a long-term restoration program in the department, we're going to be able to move a lot quicker and be able to, you know, take some other actions that might improve these tools, like doing a rulemaking or something. But if we don't get that, it's not that we're going to abandon these efforts either. We we right. we, we have every intention of seeing these through and, and making them permanent tools, assuming they work to work out well. Yeah, let me just Definitely. double on that. That's absolutely right. The The deal here is for us to create some tools. The uh, capacity within the department to implement those tools is what we're talking about with continued funding and effort. We want to develop the tools, but as you can see, we have a small subset of the department here. The sheer fact that it takes to learn and understand a new regulatory approach, both within the department and with our stakeholders, et cetera, is the time and the, and, and the space we need to roll this out largely across the state. So the ability to have dedicated staff that are well-versed in understanding this in a long-term effort obviously makes things easier. It gives us the staff capacity to interact with you on a more frequent basis and have that you know early dialogue, consultation, conversation to really move through these. But absent all of that, we're definitely not going to abandon any of these improvements and efficiencies that we find. We're going to figure out ways to work them into the program, um, start to and begin to, you know, continue to educate our staff on using these and rolling these processes out. It's just a matter of how fast can we do it and going forward, how well can we do it based on um, 
the other demands that the staff have through our regular permitting programs and granting programs where they're already working on these. So the hope is that we can expand the department's ability to be more engaged as we go forward and continue this level of engagement as we have now with the staff that are redirected. But we definitely don't want to uh, send a note that we're developing these tools and come Jan June 30th, if there's no funding, that they, they're going to sit on a shelf. The intent is to figure out, to create tools, how we create tools that can be beneficial going forward. And then the question will just be, how do we implement that and how fast can we do it based on existing resources and staffing uh, within the department if we're absent any new funding and new resources? Great. OK. So if there aren't any additional questions, we'll go ahead and change gears. Hopefully you all can see um, a new presentation there on the screen. Um, we're going to talk about our uh, natural community conservation plans, NCCPs, and regional conservation investment strategies, RCIS. Um, strategies. Uh, we have uh, a couple presentations to go through on this topic. Uh, Shannon Lucas, who is a supervising environmental scientist in our department's habitat conservation planning branch, is going to talk to you about NCCPs. And then Amy Olson, who is our RCIS coordinator in the habitat conservation planning branch, is going to talk about the RCIS program. So um, if you guys are ready to go, uh, Shannon, and you can see my screen. Take it away. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Shannon Lucas. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? There we go. So um, I just wanted to introduce briefly that um, I'm the supervisor in what's called our Landscape Conservation Planning Program. And that program oversees a couple of large scale landscape conservation planning efforts, such as natural community conservation plans, and regional conservation investment strategies. Our program also oversees a couple of um, mitigation crediting programs, namely the Conservation and Mitigation Banking Program. And um, there's a new program under the RCIS program that's for mitigation credit agreements. But today, as Matt mentioned, we're just going to be focusing on NCCPs and RCISs. Next slide. So just a brief overview of how landscape conservation planning is conducted. It's basically to analyze resources at a large landscape scale and to utilize the principles of conservation biology, namely, you know, that larger is better, connected is better, um, less edge is better, and, you know, fewer larger reserves are better than smaller scattered ones. And, um, and then ideally you would use a bunch of different data layers and information um, to come up with a cohesive conservation strategy or priority areas for doing conservation administration. Next slide, please. So first I'm gonna be talking about natural community conservation plans, which are part of our Fish and Game Code starting in section 2800. Next slide, please. I think you'll have to click through this one. I didn't realize there was animations. Great. So in a, in a nutshell, the purpose of an NCCP is to avoid uncoordinated project by project permitting and mitigation. And so ideally the plan would result in conservation of habitat over a large regional area. And that results in the conservation of species and natural communities in a large and interconnected reserve system. And it also results in streamlined species permitting for compatible and well-planned development projects. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I have a graphic to sort of illustrate this if you want to go ahead and click through. So the idea without an NCCP, the idea is that um, generally speaking, there's project by project permits, keep um, so each of these X's is an impact and um, it would have an associated mitigation project, but if it's not done in a coordinated fashion, you're going to have a lot of Did I lose you there, Shannon? Are you waiting for me?
think you froze there, Shannon. You back? She's back. OK. We can't hear you, Shannon. Hear you, I don't Shannon. know if you're muted. Oh. Thank you. you. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Go Thanks. ahead. Sorry. My computer died, so I'm on my phone. Um, <laughs> Thank God for teams on phones. So uh, the essential thing is that project by project mitigation can result in uh, uncoordinated and, and um, separated mitigation projects that aren't um, that aren't connected and that don't result in a larger reserve system. Next slide, please. So in an NCCP, go ahead and click through. Um, the idea is that there's impacts that occur in sort of the, the less sensitive areas. Those are the X's. And then those projects then pay into the NCCP and go ahead and oh, you can see where the dollar signs are. And the NCCP then takes those fees from those projects and invests them in conserving and restoring habitat in the areas that were identified as being high priority for species and habitat and connectivity. Um, and so it's all done in a more coordinated uh, cohesive fashion. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go over some of the key features of an NCCP are that it does result in a long term permit. It's generally anywhere from 25 to 50. Some are longer years. And it does permit, as um, Steve mentioned earlier, it does permit the take of CISA listed species, but it also permits the take of non-listed species. So those would be the species of special concern that Steve mentioned, as well as just common species. And it does allow take of fully protected species. And an NCCP more or less delegates take authority to the permittees. So tr tr traditionally an NCCP permittee would be like a city or a county or perhaps a water authority or something. And we delegate take authority to them and then they then delegate their take authority for their projects or to other entities that um, are under their regulatory authority. Um, and NCCP does have par public participation requirements. And importantly, um, an NCCP, the finding we have to make for the covered species is that it must conserve the covered species, which is, is almost uh, basically doing anything and everything you need to do to make sure that species is not imperiled or in, um, under any sort of threat in the plan area. And that's, that's really, that's generally considered above and beyond just mitigation. It's conservation, it's a higher standard, it and it generally requires additional conservation and restoration. And for that reason, NCCPs, have been able to be eligible for grant funding from certain programs, for example, the US Fish and Wildlife Section 6 grant program and Prop 68, because those projects are not deemed mitigation, they're deemed above and beyond mitigation. Um, next slide, please. So um, in an NCCP, I, I think most people traditionally think of an NCCP as covering urban and suburban development, like housing, or perhaps transportation or infrastructure projects. But it's important to note that NCCPs can and generally do cover reserve management activities. So when the NCCP conserves the habitat, it also has to manage it. And doing some of those management activities, such as monitoring or habitat restoration, um, may result in take of species. And so the NCCP also permits take of species um, that result from that, um, from those activities. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I wanted to give you an example that I found um, for a restoration project that was conducted through an NCCP using the take authority of the NCCP. And this was, um, it's called the Coyote Valley Preserve South Meadow Restoration Project. And this is a project within the Santa Clara, uh, it was conducted by the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. So they are not a permittee under the NCCP. So they weren't able to get take coverage as a permittee, but they were able to get take authority as a participating special entity under the Santa Clara Valley HCP NCCP um, because there are special provisions in some NCCPs where an entity that isn't under the regulatory authority of any of the permittees, they can still apply to get take coverage for their projects. And so I wanted to 
note that because um, some of you out there who are doing your restoration projects, if you're within an NCCP area, you may be able to get take coverage for your restoration project for species, um, either if you're under the regulatory, regulatory authority of one of the NCCP permittees, or there may be the opportunity to apply as a participating special entity like this project did. And this project included some hydrologic, hydrologic improvements, riparian plantings, and grassland enhancements. Um, next slide. So um, just where we are with the program in general, um, Chad mentioned there's 17 approved plans. So I didn't include the newest one, which is very recent that we approved for Placer. But there's, um, I guess, a total of 17 plans uh, throughout the state. And, and there are approximately nine plans that are currently in various stages of preparation. So you'll see all these, these darker areas on the map include those that are both in preparation and approved. Next slide. And I just wanted to note, there are some ways that um, NCTPs can be used for restoration purposes, not just traditional development, as I mentioned. So one way restoration projects can be used is they can sort of help to implement projects in priority areas. As I mentioned, NCCPs identify sort of the ideal reserve system as a priority for conservation and restoration. And NCCPs uh, also generally include um, measures and, and objectives for um, doing actual restoration activities for the covered species. And so restoration projects can help to implement some of those projects in high priority areas. Um, as I mentioned, NCCPs have been eligible for grant funds through some programs, and it's possible that being part of a coordinated, um, well thought out conservation plan um, can give you additional points in grant applications. Um, as I mentioned before, too, if you may be able to get take authority for species either under the regulatory authority of a permittee or as a participating special entity, and doing that would really streamline your permitting process for um, species depending on the type of species that you need, including, as I mentioned, or as Steve mentioned, you know, if you have non-listed species that are covered by the NCCP, you would not need to get um, uh, scientific collecting permit for your restoration activities. And then also I wanted to note, as I mentioned before, NCCPs require public participation and therefore, you know, if, if there are NCCP efforts going on in the areas that you work in, it may be really beneficial for you to participate directly in the NCCP planning process, either as a stakeholder or just by providing public comments throughout the process to make sure that the covered activities and the covered species would, uh, or to try to make sure that they would meet your needs for any anticipated restoration projects that you might be working on. Next slide, please. Okay, and now I'm going to hand it over to Amy Olson, RCIS program coordinator. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to do an overview of the RCIS program. RCIS is uh, Regional Conservation Investment Strategies, and um, this is in, co in Fish and Game Code uh, 1850 to 1861. Um, go ahead and advance. Um, so this is just a brief um, overview of the whole program. Um, I'm, I'm the, the remainder of the, the discussion will focus mostly on the RCIS, but I just want to give you guys an idea of the full program. Um, so there is a, there's three components. Um, the first one is the Regional Conservation Assessment, or RCA, um, and this is done at a very large scale on the order of a USDA um, ecoregion, um, so very large. And um, the RCA is, is essentially a gathering of um, existing information um, about the area and, and recording um, a, an ecological assessment of, of what is um, existing in the area. Um, the RCIS document, um, to, to, to make things confusing, there's the RCIS program and then the RCIS document. Um, so the RCIS um, document itself um, is is at a smaller scale, um, typically um, a, a county size or thereabouts. Um, and it 
in, it involves the um, assessment similar to an RCA, um, much more detailed though. And then it also includes a strategy portion um, which lays out um, what should be a, efficient um, conservation um, and advanced mitigation within the RCIS area. Um, there's a third component called a mitigation credit agreement or MCA. And this is one of a few ways that an RCIS can be implemented. Um, the MCA specifically results in creating mitigation credits. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, some key features of the RCIS, um, it's voluntary, um, it's non-regulatory, um, it, it, it must be prepared by a public entity, um, it, you know, that could be a local entity or, you know, state, whatever, um, and it does need to be prepared with uh, local and public input. Um, it relies on uh, existing available scientific information, so there's no requirement for um, additional studies or analyses. Um, they certainly can be done, but it's not required. Um, it guides uh, conservation at a regional scale. Um, unlike an NCCP, it does not result in a permit, um, so no streamlining with the RCIS. However, there's no conservation commitment, um, which allows it to be um, a little bit easier to uh, develop an RCIS in areas that maybe don't have funding to do a full NCCP or don't have the political climate that would allow the development of an NCCP or, or that, that sort of thing. Um, and it's non-binding on land use authorities. Um, advance, please. Um, so there's a lot of information that you'll find in an RCIS. I'm just going to go over a couple um, key pieces of information um, that you might be interested in looking at if you um, were interested in, in uh, opening up an RCIS. Um, so I'm not going to go through this whole list. Um, it's just examples, but one of the key pieces is that um, um, existing conditions as, uh, assessment that I had mentioned. So there's a lot of components that go into that. Um, not only uh, existing um, conditions of natural resources in the area, but also what is um, existing um, as far as development, um, um, pressures and stressors, including climate change, that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, focal species and other conservation elements are another uh, key piece of information that you're going to find in an RCIS. Um, these are the list of the natural resources that the RCIS focuses on. So um, any of the species natural resources um, are, are going to be listed as the focal species and any non-species um, uh, um, areas of focus are going to be the other conservation elements. So that could be, um, you know, habitats or natural communities, um, aquatic resources, uh, habitat or uh, excuse me, wildlife um, connectivity, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and there is uh, some required information that goes along with uh, with each of those. Um, um, and and then there's a, a another category of of, excuse me, of species um, that can be included in the RCIS uh, called non-focal species. It's not required, um, but it is very handy because this category of species can be um, added to the RCIS without uh, the requirement of all the full suite of information that's required for a focal species. Um, and for the non-focal species, um, basically uh, the, the, the requirement is to include a discussion about the ecological requirements and then um, have a discussion about how those non-focal species are associated with either a focal species or other conservation element. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice way to um, include additional species in the RCIS um, without um, including the, you know, the, the extensive information that's required for the focal species. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, and then the last um, piece of, of information in the RCIS that I'm going to um, discuss today is the strategy um, for the focal species and other conservation elements. Um, and that includes goals, objectives, actions, and priorities. Um, and the, the, the actions are um, what is the, the way that the RCIS is implemented. And as I mentioned, um, an RCIS can be implemented in a number of ways, including MCAs, if the goal is to create mitigation credits. Um, it, the, the RCIS can also be implemented for um, just conservation purposes as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just um, some examples of um, actions that are typically in, included in an RCIS. Um, the, the, so it includes, you know, creation, restoration, protection of um, habitats and creeks and rivers and that, uh, that sort of thing. And then it also includes um, uh, if if uh, wildlife crossings over roads it, are particularly important in in a certain in the RCIS area, or um, remediation of fish barriers or that sort of thing, and the actions are, you know, specific to each of the um, focal species and the other conservation elements. Uh, next slide, please. Um. So uh, in order to implement an RCIS, the RCIS has to be approved. Um, so we currently have four approved um, RCISs in the state. We expect um, two, possibly three more to be approved this calendar year. Um, so you can see where those um, are at this point in time. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then I just wanted to include some um, thoughts uh, or ideas of how um, the restoration community can get involved um, or interact with RCISs. So, of course, you know, I've mentioned um, implementing actions. Um, uh, so the, the first three bullets are, are really, you know, uh, directed towards that. Um, uh, there are, the RCIS identifies priority actions um, and or areas, and so that's, you know, a good place to look at um, for implementing actions. Um, and then uh, similar to NCCPs, there may be um, a possibility of additional points um, in grant applications if you are implementing an action in an RCIS area. Um, beyond implementation of the RCIS, um, you can get involved in um, development of an RCIS through public participation. RCISs go through um, a public review process. Um, and then um, if, if you're in an area where um, you feel like uh, um, regional conservation would really benefit your area, but um, an RCIS or NCCP is not um, currently um, in development there. Um, if an RCIS would, would fit with the needs of your particular um, location, you can encourage local entities to prepare an RCIS. And uh, the, the um, wildlife um, WCB uh, um, currently has a Prop 68 grant program that offers um, funding for development of RCISs. Um, so that is one way that um, uh, to, to uh, help get those going is, um, uh, I, uh, you know, let your local entities know that that money is out there. Um, and I think that might be my last slide. Um, there's our, um, Contact information, our webpage, um, if anybody's interested in looking at the information um, about our programs, um, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Shannon, um, for that overview of NCCPs and RCIS. Um, any questions from 
the group on either of those topics. kind of making sure I'm catching up here. There's some uh, chatter yeah. about uh, uh, HERA. Um, yeah, if I can make a comment on that. Yeah, go Matt. ahead, Chad. Uh, while folks are thinking about questions for landscape conservation planning. So just to, to clarify some questions we've received through this um, presentation as well as through email, and I'm getting pinged over here on the side. Uh, it, it's our understanding, our apologies. We were under the impression that the HRA ledge report had been released. It is not. It is still going through the proposal or the review process. So um, it has not gone to the legislature. But when it does, obviously, we will share back with the group, post on our website, uh, whatever, make it available to folks and what have you. But it was uh, our misunderstanding that it's actually been released. So it is still in the approval process. We hope any day it will go through um, and, and get through that process. But again, my apologies for any um, misunderstanding or confusion that folks have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, there was a question. Um, these presentations are very helpful, but there is a lot of information covered at a speedy pace. Would it be possible for CDFW to do individual one hour presentations and Q&A's with each presenter? Um, you're right. The, this was a lot of information today. Uh, we, we knew uh, we were presenting a lot of information and, and we're happy to, to have all of these options in one place. Um, time permitting, resources permitting, we would love to do more of these uh, engagement opportunities with um, our, our stakeholders. Um, we will be making this presentation, these presentations available online as well as a copy of the uh, uh, the recording uh, we're, we're going to post a uh, recording of today's presentation so folks can refer back to that um, susan if you have uh, specific ideas or, or topics you're interested in, in hearing more about uh, let's follow up on on that and, and see what resources we can make available and, and who we might be able to connect you with to, to answer some specific questions um, what makes a priority for a county or a region to develop an RCIS or NCCP? Shannon or Amy, I'll take it. Title that one. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'll take the NCCP uh, portion and I'll throw it over to Amy. Um, so generally, NCCPs are developed in areas that either have or anticipate having a lot of um, urban or suburban development pressure, and so usually the county or city cities want to get ahead of it and sort of help to control where and how the development is going to happen so that they can have a little bit more control over where and how the resources in their area can be conserved. And also, um, the development community is sometimes in favor of that in these high pressure development areas because they know that they're going to get a streamlined species permit if, if there's an NCCP in place because rather than doing their own project by project permitting, they just go through the NCCP and pay a fee and it's all taken care of. So that's at least for NCCPs, it tends to be in high development, anticipated development areas. Amy? Yeah, and then, um, well, for RCISs, it was, I think the, the program was developed um, to sort of cater to, to areas that are, that are opposite that <laughs> that might not have a lot of um, development pressure might not have the funding might not have the political climate to allow um, development of a full nccp but still desires um, regional conservation planning um, it, it, so it, the, however i will say that a lot of the um, RCISs to date um, are are actually developed in areas that um, that have overlapping NCCPs, um, and so even if in those situations um, the 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 benefit of ha having overlapping NCCPs and RCISs is, is that the RCIS can um, you know cover a, additional species that the NCCP doesn't cover, or it can um, you know, extend the, the area um, or, you know, it can 
allow opportunities for entities that um, that might not ha be be able to get coverage through the NCCP. Um, I don't know, Shannon, if you have more to add to that. <laughs> I think that that's good, Amy. And then there was a, a question about how uh, both NCCPs and RCISs uh, are are distinguished from conceptual area protection plans. <laughs> <laughs> well, the simple answer for NCCPs is that an NCCP does give a take permit for species, whereas a CAP does not give a take permit per species. Um, RCISs are a little more tricky and that's why I'll give it to Amy. <laughs> um, so my understanding is that uh, CAPs are not necessarily meant to be public documents, um, whereas RCISs are. Um, in, in, in talking with the, the wildlife branch, I feel like that is one of the main uh, differences between a CAP um, and an RCIS. Um, the CAP is also um, specifically developed to help um, WCB prioritize um, um, purchasing of lands. And I, I'm, I, I might not have that fully correct, but that's um, that's my understanding is that the, the development of the CAP is really for the purpose of WCB to use that to, to help prioritize um, their, their grant efforts. Um, whereas the, the RCIS can really be used by anybody. Um, and, and even development of an MCA um, is, you know, anybody can do that. It doesn't have to be um, a, a particular entity or anything. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, if you want to develop a mitigation credit agreement, that can only be done under an RCIS, so it can't be developed under a CAP. Um, and then I just want to tear off of what you said about public availability. Uh, CAPs have very project par parcel specific information, which um, is, can be more sensitive, whereas RCISs are a broader, larger scale, so they don't um, have parcel specific information. Great. Okay. Any other questions from the group? If there's folks on the phone, you want to try and unmute, you can attempt doing that with uh, star six. Otherwise, folks can use the chat feature. Give it a minute here. Folks might be a little fatigued. Uh, but we're ahead of schedule and, and got through a lot of information. So I, I just want to, you know, really thank everyone for, for hanging in there and, and coming in with a lot of great questions and, and some dense questions. And we're, we're still at 200 plus folks. So um, obviously this is um, a worthwhile uh, set of topics to dig into. Um, if anybody else has anything for the goody the order um, otherwise we can wrap it up again uh, we're gonna make a recording of today's uh, uh, presentation available with copies of the presentations uh, for folks who want to review those Chad do you have anything uh, uh, while folks were just thinking if they had any last minute questions we don't need to keep everybody all day and I really just want to again thank everybody for participating the folks that hung on for three hours and the others that had to leave a little bit early. Really, this is spearheaded by you all and your comments and your suggestions and um, your motivation for us to, to take some of these things on and, and really figure out where we can go in the restoration community um, and provide some support to you, some clarification, and in general, just really increase our pace and scale of habitat restoration. So I thank you again so much for all of it. I thank our staff, the folks that worked uh, to present today and create all this material for you, but also the other folks that are working hard behind the scenes and really um, digging in to roll up their sleeves and think through this stuff and, and just work within the department on really what has been a pretty fun adventure so far for us to 
have the time and space to cr create and collaboratively work together on these things, which we don't typically do. So there's a new model here for us that we're exploring internally of how we communicate <clears throat> and how we think about things in the long term. So, <clears throat> excuse me, again, thank you so much for being here today. This conversation is not ending, uh, even though we're going to end this session. Um, so we look forward to continued dialogue and uh, further input. Thanks a lot. And thank one, you. one more uh, quick reminder before we go, go ahead, um, yes. is uh, just that when we do post the, the presentation, there's a lot of contact information for the different folks who spoke today. Um, you're undoubtedly going to have follow-up questions when you try to go back and digest this and think through all the information we presented. Don't be shy. Please feel free to send follow-up questions by email, and we'll be happy to get back to you and answer them as best we can. So thanks a lot, everybody. Absolutely. We will be posting uh, links to the recordings and these presentations on our CDFW website in a couple places. We'll put them on the on the main grant opportunities uh, web page, which is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash grants. Uh, and we'll put them on our Prop 1 grant um, program page. We'll also send out a, a newsletter email when we get that posted to let folks uh, know they can go there and there'll be some links uh, where people can uh, directly go and find that information. So again, thank you everyone. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's effort uh, to be a part of this and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.